Welcome to Shree's Sunday New York Times read-along. My name is Neil Parikh, executive producer of Shree's Sunday New York Times read-along. We have a great guest planned for today. Claudia Dreyfus is a longtime New York Times writer known for her interviews with scientists, policymakers, and international figures. Uh, we'll be talking about her long career in journalism, uh, some of the great interviews she's had. She'll be telling us some wonderful stories. Uh, we'll also be talking uh, about some special sections in the New York Times today. They have a new at-home section, uh, a photo diary of life uh, in isolation uh, under uh, uh, COVID-19, the New York Times kids section. Uh, we also have uh, a focus um, on uh, people who we've lost under coronavirus. Uh, there's really so much to cover, and uh, we just really want to uh, uh, bring the show uh, to you. So we're going to start off. Uh, with a uh, uh, shot of New York uh, from uh, Shree's, uh, out Shree's uh, balcony. Um, and uh, Shree, uh, thank you for uh, uh, hosting today, as always. What a, it's a little bit gray outside in New York, it looks like, a little gloomy. Um, yeah, it's, it's 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 10 degrees Celsius. And you're seeing New York like you've never seen it. This shot you've seen for five years. But if you look down, you can see how empty New York is. Sunday morning is quiet normally, but never like this. This is how it is throughout the day, every day. You see some cars because we are right on the West Side Highway. Right there is the West Side Highway. So just to orient everyone, West Side of New York, and you're looking at Midtown there, and those are the tall buildings in Midtown. All the way in the distance is the World Trade Center. There is the Hudson River. And there is New Jersey. And then if you swing around this way, you can see little bits of Central Park. And so that's where we are. And, uh, and Shree, it uh, looks like your, your camera froze for a second. And came back. Yes. Shree, you're so back. Were we having some Good. troubles with the camera? So maybe we'll stay in here uh, warm inside and we still get the same sort of look. Slightly further north there is the George Washington Bridge. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Please tag your friends. Please hit share. We want as many people to see this as possible. Let me know where you're watching from. Uh, Neil's going to show on screen the various places where people are joining us. We love seeing folks from around the world. Uh, Roberta is watching from Richmond. Thank you so much, Roberta, for being here. Uh, Bimal Nepal from Cambridge is here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Paul is watching from Tallahassee. You'll meet her again in a minute. Let's see who else is here. Linda from Long Island. I'm looking at the wrong river, Linda, on the east side is where Long Island is. My mom's watching from Kerala. Hi, Amma. Wait, let me do this. Let me flip the camera around for my mom so she can see. Hi, Amma. Great to mom see you. Mom needs to see your uh, face, Shree. Love that you are able to catch it. Yeah. Uh, I love that she can see some of our shows like this. Doug is watching from San Francisco, former guest, terrific guest at SF Doug. Please follow him. Let's see who else we got. And from then Twitter. watching from Dharamshala. And Dharamshala is, as many of you know, the home of the Dalai Lama. And Stefan, our friend, is watching from Ramsey, New Jersey, part of our awesome team that does production work, social media work. If you like what you see today, get in touch. We can help you visual, virtualize your events. We are doing some big, big things for big universities and arts organizations and businesses and nonprofits. We're helping even people host their own show like this. So if you'd like to do that, get in touch with me, Sri at Sri.net or write to Neil. We're just so happy to have so many people. Five years of the New York Times read along. Uh, please be in touch with us. And we also so glad for all of you for being here. We have a busy news week to talk about and so much happening in the world. So we wanna make sure that we can uh, get to all of those developments uh, or at least as many of them as possible. So let's uh, also get a sense of some of the people who've been here in the past on our read along. We have a terrific guest today as we always have a terrific guest. Look at this, uh, you'd call this a, a murderer's row uh, as they said of the 27 Yankees uh, the 1927 Yankees, as Neil knows, big Yankees fan. Tom Jolly, New York Times print editor. Amy Vership, New York Times travel editor. We went to their homes.
to do their interviews, which was amazing. Uh, Stacey Stewart, president and CEO of the March of Dimes. Harlan Coben, author, best-selling author. He was uh, with us the day he hit number one, the New York Times bestseller list. He's also got three Netflix shows on at the same time. I hope you will be catching some of them, including Safe and The Stranger. Mm -hmm. And we also had Sunny Slaughter with us. Sunny was guest on the 1619 Project uh, edition that we did. And those are just a tiny sliver of who has been watching our show, who has been speaking on our shows. And you can uh, get the entire archives by going to the URL that Neil has posted. Also, by just subscribing to me on YouTube, Srinet is my YouTube channel, S-R-E-E-N-E-T. You go there, you subscribe, you'll get all my live shots. This show, of course, every Sunday. And then every day, every single day, we do a live show talking about COVID-19 exclusively. Last night, we had three amazing doctors. And tonight is Sunday Positivity Night. And 9 p.m. Eastern, we are live. And you can watch as we talk to as you can see here, Positivity with Purna Jagannathan. She is an actress. You've seen her on Little Big and Big Little Lies, The Night of, Delhi Belly, Better Call Saul. And she is going to be on tomorrow's Monday Netflix premiere of Never Have I Ever. That's Mindy Kaling's new show, and she, Purna is acting on it. Uh, so please do check it out. And as you can see, we're now in partnership with Scroll.in, one of India's biggest uh, independent culture and news sites. We They have more than 2 million followers on their social ch channels and we're live on their channel. So if you'd like to do partnerships with us also, please let us know. We'd love to have you uh, join us. So Neil, we've got a very busy show, lots going on. Let's bring in the team. Ab absolutely, I'd love to do that. Uh, we have a, an excellent team that brings together the uh, New York Times read along for you every week. Um, and uh, to do that, I'm going to bring in uh, first Paula Kiger from Tallahassee. Hey, Paula. Morning, everybody. Uh, and we have Steve Taylor uh, from Philadelphia, who's uh, watching LinkedIn for us. Uh, and then Julia Weeks as well, uh, who is uh, in also in Facebook. So I'll just take a moment uh, and explain to you what we do and how we do it. I'm managing the show uh, from StreamYard. Uh, which is the app that we use to uh, produce the show every week. Um, and I'm just getting our uh, Twitter handles, our, our team's handles up there. Um, but what I, what I wanted to explain for folks who are watching, and particularly if you're watching for the first time, uh, one of the things that we do is we always have a host uh, in, in the channels that we're primarily uh, 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 streaming to. So Paula Kiger is going to be your host, your production host in Facebook, in Shree's Facebook page. She'll be dropping in links, uh, addressing any technical issues, engaging with the audience. Steve Taylor will be doing the same in LinkedIn. Um, and uh, if you have comments there, Steve will send them to me so I can post them on the show. Julia is actually joining us today because uh, Claudia Dreyfus, our guest today, uh, is um, uh, letting us stream directly to her Facebook page. So if you're watching on Claudia's page, uh, please know that Julia Weeks is part of our team, uh, and she's there to help you and, and, and point out uh, some of the articles that we're, we're talking about, but also address any technical issues that might come up. Uh, I'm the executive producer of the show. Shri is the host, uh, and I uh, can't thank uh, our team enough. You can follow them on social media. Uh, my, you can follow me at Neil Parekh. Paula is at Big Green Pen. Steve Taylor is at Steve Derive, and uh, Julia is at Julia L. Weeks. Love the branding, love the consistency across uh, <laughs> channels. Shri, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I'd like to say uh, this is also a murderer's row. I mean it in the best of sense. <laughs> uh, some folks watching internationally have never heard that term before. It's used in baseball, and it's an Americanism that like a lot of Americanisms are at the moment don't feel, don't uh, hit quite right uh, given everything that's going on, but at least murders are down. Uh, and so we can call them murderers row. Uh, it just means that these are the best of the best. And these are part of the team that we have that can come in and help you with your events. If you've seen the production quality of this show versus the production quality of my show, although my solo show, which is truly solo, I don't have any people on there helping apart from our live tweeters who are wonderful, Vandana and Rose, 
uh, we want to show you that what you can do with a truly professional team of producers who we bring in for mm -hmm. projects. We are able to pay them because of our sponsors that you're about to hear in a minute. So I'm very excited and very grateful to everybody who supports us. We've had a five year journey together and experiment on Facebook Live has become a truly uh, community building opportunity and people around the world have been watching. And I know Paula will share her excellent article that she wrote before she joined the team. She was just a viewer and she wrote an excellent piece. So uh, do check that out when you get a chance in Facebook, she'll post that. We're live on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube and on LinkedIn. And this is an example of why you need producers, why you have to pay people to do good work. On my daily show, I don't have a, a producer inside LinkedIn and people post comments and it's crickets as a result. So all of this is to say, whatever work you're doing, pay your people, it makes a difference. Thank you, Shree, appreciate it. If you're interested in having us produce a show like this for you, uh, please contact uh, Shree at Shree.net. And, and we will uh, uh, be happy to discuss uh, the possibilities. Uh, I'm gonna ask our uh, producers to uh, go back to their stations, uh, if you will, and uh, engage uh, with the audience. Thank you again, Paula, Steve, and uh, Julia uh, for joining us. Okay. And uh, I'm sure we'll hear from you later in the show. And before we bring in our guest, I just wanna say we have another guest that comes in at 10 a.m., our idea is to always have a medical guest on the show because we want to have as much medical information as possible. And this week we have Anne Sansevero who's with us and is a registered nurse whose uh, aging life practice means she is working with people in the 80 to 100 plus age group and very important at this time for us to hear from her. So she's going to join us at 10 o'clock, Neil. And uh, you know, we have a, a number of people watching, Neil Gensliker and, and Carla Baranakis, uh, two friends of the show, former guests, uh, checked in earlier. Uh, Rochelle Philippak from Hastings on Hudson. We had uh, Monica perez Navarez from Puerto Rico. Uh, you uh, were able to uh, give your mom a shout out, Sri. I need to do the same. My mom is watching from Hastings on Hudson as well. Thank you, mom. Uh, we have Albert Johari, Dr. Johari, who was our a doctor at last week's uh, show. A friend of Paula Tigers is watching this week uh, as well. So thank you. And for we want him to come back too at some point. Coming back, absolutely. Um, and uh, we have a, a, a long-term guest, Pauline uh, uh, Misiak, used to watch you when you first started five years ago, Shri. Uh, so oh she, uh, it's great to have her back and watching. Um, so without um, further ado, uh, we should we should take care of some business before we bring on uh, our guest, Shri. Uh, we do want to thank our sponsors for all of the uh, uh, support they've given us. Um, uh, we have three great sponsors, uh, Strategy Focus Group, Muckrack, and Tweeps Map. Uh, we really appreciate their support and their um, uh, endorsement of the work that we're doing. Um, so we'll just share a little bit about uh, the work that they do. Uh, you know, Strategy Focus Group is a global team of human capital strategists committed to helping organizations solve people issues within your organization. They do that by working alongside you to solve your toughest problems and helping you capture your greatest opportunities. Muckrack helps you discover news as it breaks, easily generate reports and explore the work of journalists, podcasters, bloggers, and more. Muckrack software helps PR teams build stronger relationships with the media. And if you're a journalist, you might also be eligible for their free tools to identify trends and showcase your work. TweetsMap helps you build personalized relationships with your audience with focused, straightforward, actionable analytics and an all-in-one intelligent publishing platform. Thank you so much to Ron Thomas, the Strategy Focus Group, Greg Gallant and Mike Schneider from Muckrack and Samir Albatron from TweetsMap for your support of the New York Times read-along. If you are interested in uh, um, uh, sponsoring the New York Times read-along, please feel free to email me, neil at neilparek.org and we'd uh, love to uh, talk to you about sponsorship opportunities. Uh, with that, Shri, um, I know you have the paper laid out. Uh, I wanna make sure that we bring in our, our guest, Claudia Dreyfus, uh, and I can't tell you how excited I am uh, to have her join us. Um, you're gonna love hearing about her time at the, uh, her work with the New York Times, her interviews with Daniel Ortega, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 
Uh, Mel Brooks, make sure you ask her about Mel Brooks Street because that's an incredible story. Uh, there's just so much to, to ask her about. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to bring in uh, uh, Claudia Dreyfus to join mm -hmm. us on the show. Hi. Uh, Claudia, thank you for joining us. I'll step out. And uh, Shri, I'll leave the show in your uh, in your hands. Thank you. And hi, Claudia. You are amazing hi, to join us on a Sunday morning. Uh, uh, we have seen this shot before. Tell us why we know this room in your house. Well, uh, my husband, Andrew Hacker, the political scientist, was on your show two weeks ago promoting his just out book. Let me hold it up. I, I know how to do this. Um, this book is called Downfall, The Demise of the President and His Party. And it is about topic A these days. Yeah, and so uh, thank you for arranging that and thanks for being a guest. You were, you were a, a great promoter of your husband because when we started talking, you know, you, you had him go first and then here you are. Diane is watching and she says, awesome Sri Srinivasan Dream Team, Paula Kiger, Steve Taylor, Julia Weeks, and Neil Parikh. Thank you very much. Roberta says, you've inspired me at the Virginia Faith Interfaith Center to launch our weekly broadcast. Uh, I'm so uh, delighted that you could do that. Uh, Claudia, tell us a little bit about uh, why this paper matters. You see this laid out in front of you. Uh, we have so many things to talk about today. We have uh, the special kids section that they do once a month. They have the special print section, Still Lives, about uh, visual diaries from 15 photographers give a glimpse of a life of isolation. And then the biggest news of the week or uh, for a long time in the New York Times that they launched a new section, weekly section called At Home. And uh, this is uh, combining parts of other sections that they're going to not uh, do separate stories or separate sections on, including the travel section. This is gonna be the last week of the travel section until travel is possible. Again, travel stories will continue to run, but not this way. Okay, so let's uh, get Claudia's thoughts. What does this newspaper mean to you first? Well, first of all, there's nothing like it in the world. It is the greatest newspaper in the world. And I, I say that as both a reader and, and, a, and an occasional writer for it. Uh, but more than that, in it's, it's, it's evolved into something fascinating. When I first began writing for the Times in 92, it was, as they say, the staid gray lady. It is incredibly creative this, these days. I mean, things opened up in a way that no one could have imagined. Uh, there's a lot of different things in the Times each week, but the degree to which it's been experimental, the degree to which they've really tried to do new things and integrate new media, they fail sometimes. Some of it doesn't work, but they're trying. And uh, I'm just astounded at all the fascinating things that are being done. The children's section is just wonderful, but uh, you're always astonished. The other thing is it's on paper. And I, I teach at Columbia University. I teach graduate students in the sciences, but I teach them journalism. And I always have them read the, the Sunday paper on paper because you see things that you, in a context, you see things that you wouldn't see if you just logged in. You see the past, the present, you see how it relates to one another. If you just log in, which is a good way to work too, but uh, you only find what you're looking for or what's on the front page. You don't find what the whole world is looking like at this moment. And that's in the Sunday Times. Thank you. Let's actually look at the Saturday paper for just a quick second, just to compare what has happened, because so much is happening all the time, Claudia. Here is three states ease limits on a public that's still wary, and that continues. And Trump uh, speech creates a risk at West Point. So there, he's supposed to speak because he adores the risk, uh, the pomp and circumstance uh, of the military. He wants to be associated with it. But this headline, Trump speech creates a risk could now be about almost any story or any time he's speaking because we have seen that he's able to cause direct problems when he speaks and chaos. He's been, he wanted to be called the chaos president. He loved embracing chaos. He's now causing it as we see as well. But let's look at the front page of the New York Times. Tell me, as you look at this, you were saying, you know, it's no longer the gray paper. 
what is the layout here? What is the use of photography? Let's uh, get some of your uh, critique uh, slash uh, philosophy as you look at this. Well, uh, I, I, let, let me say, uh, it, not the, uh, your, your previous statement might have been misinterpreted. I, what I said was that in the past it was the gray lady. It's not gray anymore. Uh, it is vibrant, lively, full of color, um, very exciting, uh, and very experimental at the same time being factual. So I have to confess I'm, I'm worse than one of the students who didn't do their homework. Uh, what, what my paper just arrived. So I haven't seen the front page. You're going to have to do the interpretation for me. By the way, our uh, paper delivery man, Rod Anderson, he lives in the Bronx and he gets up often at five, three in the morning to get down here to Midtown Manhattan to deliver our papers. He's a fabulous person. We're, we're so grateful that he does this. Talk about essential workers. This is essential too. It keeps us in touch, especially since we're now homebound. So uh, I rather I, I have a note from my doctor. The paper didn't <laughs> five minutes ago. But I, yeah, I, we 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 uh, heard about Rod Anderson last week, uh, two weeks ago, from uh, Andrew's uh, web uh, show that he did with us, and how important Rod is in your lives, as are so many workers uh, who uh, do so much important work, not just the medical staff, of course, first responders, but grocery store clerks and uh, folks who work in uh, different ways to make sure. We have deliveries and we have food and, and, and newspaper delivery is one of them. So let's look at the paper. The headline is jump. testing remains. Sorry, go ahead. I wanted to jump in on a point you made, which is very important and very moving. Um, one of the upsides of this terrible moment is at least people are recognizing the dignity of work and people who work every day. Uh, we had gotten away from that and we, we just started seeing them and it, as sort of automated pieces of our lives. Now, these are people who make our lives move. And I think people are understanding that it's seven every night in the city. People go downstairs and they, they applaud each other. And they applaud the people who are making their lives still, still come together. And I think that's great. And Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I, Just I it nowhere. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I think it's wonderful. And uh, the dignity of work is something that we all need to appreciate. And also there's that word, Claudia, that people use, unskilled labor. Turns out so many kinds of unskilled labor turn out to be essential. So how do we go from uns who decides these words and why we pay them or why we uh, deal with immigration or and immigrants who are deemed worthier for in some ways? And that's one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm always um, thinking about. Okay, uh, let's move on here. So these are the two big stories there. And then held together by prayers and duct tape, University Hospital of Brooklyn lays bare disparity in health system. We're so proud of America's health system. And uh, we've also seen the worst elements of how this disparity plays out. Prescriptions rose as Trump praised drugs. This is where I believe that everyone who has said that Trump says it like it is, and Trump is absolutely, uh, you know, just sharing what's on his mind. The president shouldn't be sharing what's on his mind. The drugs that he recommended, including hydrochloroquine, has turned out they've stopped a lot of the trials because they are not effective and they're killing people. And that's so sad. A city struggles to isolate the ill as cases surge. This is in Chelsea, Massachusetts. And over here, no black back slapping and no rallies, life of the cloistered candidate. And one of the things that I posted this week is, uh, there's not a political thing, but to say, why do you not see more of Joe Biden? So this article looks like there is more of Joe Biden than I know about, and he's going out there. So I think that's going to be interesting to see how all of this plays out. For anyone who, has, who says that the election has been decided already, that Trump, with all this chaos, will definitely be uh, will definitely lose. I want to remind you that on October 12th, uh, that is less than a month before the election, the tape of him 
saying he grabs women's genitals aired and he was still elected. So nothing can be predicted about Donald Trump. I've been wrong since he came down that escalator on June uh, of 2015. And I imagine we'll still be wrong as we go forward. Okay, uh, let's go in here. Let's see what else is in the paper. We love reading about what's happening. Here's an article about the weekly at home section. We'll give tips for working, playing, and coping inside. I hope what to watch. Here's a, uh, a story that's kind of sad as we look uh, at the happiest place on earth. Uh, Disney goes live with its newest park. It says in 1998, the uh, new Animal Kingdom, uh, the Times was gently charmed, if, if perhaps a bit underwhelmed. There's an impressive collection, but like Noah's Ark, it's limited in numbers. And this was the article that came out. And of course, Disney's parks are closed now around the world. One, uh, one uh, analyst said he doesn't expect them to open till January. That does not mean that's what's going to happen. But that was an analyst who has been right on other calls saying that. And we don't know. And that's one of the things we all need to say more often. We don't know. Uh, here's our students can learn to write through the pandemic. Here to help is a section. So the Times is filled with these little inventive sections, the little things, big things. Here's an ad. We love looking at the ads. America's Food and Retail Union talks about let's work together to save lives. And uh, again, those workers are making a difference. It's a slap in the face. Many victims are angry that jails freed inmates. And how much of that story is true? How many were freed? What that meant? All of that we need to know as we uh, go along. How about this tiny story here? Johnson 8 took part in secretive virus panel. The British government came under heightened pressure to disclose details about a secret scientific advisory group after a report on Friday that a top political aide to Prime Minister Johnson had taken part in the group's meetings on the coronavirus pandemic. And so it'd be interesting to see what happens. Uh, as we know, the prime minister did not take the virus seriously, just like Trump did not. And then he himself fell ill, uh, gravely ill. He recovered. We wish no ill to anyone. But it shows you that people are not, have, were many people were not taking this seriously. Uh, let's see here. More ads. The UPS store. Key, thank you for keeping your lights on so that others can too. They have 4,900 stores in the US. You can imagine that's 10, 15,000 people who work in their physical stores. And here's an ad for the census. The census must go on. And uh, it's by, it, 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 by law, it has to be counted every, by the constitution, the US population will be counted every 10 years. How will they do it? When will they do it? Uh, what will happen? Uh, big, big question. And amid lockdowns, couples scramble to tie the knot before Ramadan. So this is a story from the Middle East in Cairo. And look at this image. You know, Claudia, I think when we look back at this period, there are going to be images that are as legendary as some of the images out of other crises in the past. And images like this of families celebrating in isolation or with masks will be among them. I kind of stopped existing. Foreign students are stuck and reeling. And this is a story about what's happening uh, with American students. We heard the story of Andrew Hacker, who teaches uh, in uh, Queens College, and how he uh, uses email rather than Zoom to teach his students. So he has everyone sitting at their desk at, say, 10 o'clock, and then they all, he emails them a question, and then all 25 of them reply by email. I think it's very inventive and very clever what he's doing. Massachusetts epicenter. This is the epicenter word is uh, coming out more and more. Feel free to jump in, Claudia, if you have a thought on any of the things you're seeing here. Well, you know, I have a thought on, on just uh, creativity in general. The, the paper uh, has one of the things that, that, that's so interesting and creative is they've had to work without being in the field. And, and yet somehow they've managed to find these incredible stories without sending people out into the field that are in danger. Um, the way people have comp compensated in this difficult, difficult situation 
it's just remarkable. I mean, the stories are good, they're strong, they're well reported. But at the same time, you know, that kind of look around in your world and see how you can do it. Uh, capacity that exists at times, I think, also exists in other spheres. Everybody's doing this. I, one of the things I always tell my students is, you know, look in your world, use your world, uh, use your own experience to figure out what are stories and where you can see them. And at the beginning of the semester, I said to all my students who are not that used to going into the field, getting information, using their notes, using what they see as real information. And one of the things I did was say to them, you absolutely cannot write anything from the story. I want you to go out there, I want you to talk to people, I want you to learn stuff. Um, so now, halfway into the term, they were talked off campus very wisely uh, and sent home. And indeed, I've asked them to write from their experiences and from their memory because they can't go in the field and they're writing great stuff. And all of, all of this crisis is kind of showing us how to MacGyver things, but from our home base. And it's really interesting. Um, just using Zoom has been fascinating. Uh, we're we're going to see a lot of great art and a lot of great different kinds of reporting just developing from this situation. I bet journaling is going to be really interesting and people's own diaries and their own personal writing. It's going to turn out to be interesting. I wanted to show you, thank you so much. I want to show you this, uh, you know, Tyson Chicken, the company, they say a delicate balance feeding the nation and keeping the employees healthy, but they've also rebranded that I missed. They're now called the protein company instead of the chicken company. And that tells you that a lot of people are looking into meatless products, including soy protein and of course beyond meat and things like that. And that's what you're what you're seeing uh, here. I'd love to have our, our, our guest, Claudia Dreyfus, longtime writer of the New York Times to just tell us her own New York Times journey how did she get there or her entire journey a little bit? Tell us how she, you know, how she started her journalism, how she ended up at the New York Times, what the Times years were like. She still writes and some of the highlights of some of the interesting people she. So we're going to give her a few minutes to kind of dig into that. Wow. And uh, we'll just before we go, I'm just going to show here. This is five ways to monitor the pandemic in the U.S. Great graphics in the New York Times use of color like this and uh, telling the story in important ways. Uh, here's an ad for Facebook. Who would have thought you would see a print ad in the New York Times, double truck as they call it, and uh, parents supporting parents is an ad for this group. So it's an ad for a Facebook group. They had it at the Super Bowl, but now they have it in print and a third page. So this is all good uh, for the print newspaper that they're doing this, but let's get to Claudia Dreyfus and her story. Well, goodness, you, you you asked me about five different questions. And I always say to my students, only ask one question at a time. Um, where should I begin? Maybe in the middle. Um, the, how I came, your original question, how I came to work at the Times around 1992. Um, I had been, for many years, one of the Playboy interviewers at a time when Playboy's journalism was very much a the center things. Is that my microphone doing that noisy stuff? Um, or, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Let's, okay, let's. I'm not worried about it. If you say don't worry, I hear you. Uh, so I've been traveling around the world, interviewing heads of state, Nobel Prize winners, movie actors. Yeah, the then Sandinista president of, of Nicaragua, who's president of Believe Now. But this was like 1982 two that I interviewed him for Playboy. And the Playboy interviews were these long 20,000 word uh, Q&As that were really like long dramas uh, that uh, were quite remarkable. I had a very great editor there, Barry Golson, who, who was like the maestro of the art. And um, he, there was a lot of money, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez wearing a, a very uncharacteristic uh, 
Sutter Sombrero. Um, and I interviewed him in Paris for Playboy. I, I, I got about 27 hours of tape over, over a two week period. Um, and his, his official biographer says that it's the best interview, modestly speaking, that was ever done with him. Um, but, you know, we had the time, we had the money. It was a great gig. Um, and uh, it was suggested to the then new Sunday Magazine editor at the Times, a, a former editorial editor, uh, Jack Rosenthal, uh, he, he and I had a mutual friend, uh, the late David Anderson, an editorial writer, and David suggested that Jack might like to use me in the magazine and that I could kind of use the interviews uh, format to, to bring in very serious issues, important issues, uh, to do the kinds of things the magazine was famous for. So at the times they you know, with an exception or two, they, they didn't run Q and A's. They were considered declasse, not really journalism. Uh, and he brought me to the times I was a contributing writer to the Sunday magazine. And uh, I then had the best job in the world because, you know, one of the things about being at the times is it makes you if you're a good journalist, it makes you an even better journalist because you can get anybody in the world on the phone. Unlike at Playboy, people didn't turn me down. They almost never turned me down for an interview. You could get anyone on the phone. Um, you can get stories that other people can't. And um, I, I, I always say that, I, you know, I'm glad I had a, a reputation and a career before I ever was associated with the Times because otherwise I would have thought that all this access and all this great journalism was just me, but it wasn't. It was a mixture of me and the fantastic uh, brand that the Times is. People want to be in the Times. Uh, even, you know, I, I would, I'm told that even Donald Trump wants to be in the Times. Um, and, and is very solicitous and cares very much what, what, what they think. Now, you're running a picture of Mel Brooks. Uh, that was not for the Times, but it was one of the worst interviews I ever did. Um, and sometimes when you're doing a Q&A, you know, Q&As are so dependent on your sources, whether they're talkers, whether they have good stories, whether they're willing to share them, what kind of mood they're in. Um, and um, my experience has been oddly that really funny people make for really grim interviews very often. Garcia Marquez was very solemn. And Brooks, who I was interviewing for a different magazine, this was the year 2000, the anniversary of the great Mel Brooks, Carl Reiner um, record, the cult record, 2000 year old man, and you, you know who the 2,000-year-old man was. He was the guy who dated Joan of Arc. He was the guy with 2,000 children, but none of them ever visited. Um, anyway, I went to uh, California to interview Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner. And um, the sit of, of the record that was so important to all of us when we were growing up was that... Uh, the 2000 year old man is being interviewed. Um, uh, uh, he, uh, he's interviewed by a journalist, Carl Reiner, and, and Carl Reiner is the straight man and Mel Brooks is the funny man. Anyway, um, I get to California to, I, I think, uh, the Ritz Carlton there, or one of those, uh, the Four Seasons, uh, to do the interview. And, uh, both of them are very involved with the photographer who they like a lot and who uh, I chased from the room because I, I find that if I'm doing a QA, and a you don't want a photographer in the room. You don't want that, if you can avoid it, um, you don't want them fussing with machines and, and taking pictures and distracting the kind of a bond you have to quickly establish with your source so that they tell you something that matters. 
uh, so that they respond to you. And, and it's not it's not an easy skill. You walk into a room with a stranger and you got to get them to to tell you their their deep stories. Um, the best interview I ever did share. She she you walk in and she's there. It's not she's one of the best anyway. Um, but I walked into the room and Mel Brooks was involved with the photographer and uh, I had prepared a very, very strong interview, I felt. Uh, and I asked him if his writing about Jewish themes was his way of negating the Holocaust. And he looked at me squarely and said, I don't write about Jewish themes. Well, what do you do with that? I mean, you know, it's a dead bomb. Usually I have questions, I have follow-up questions in case it goes in one direction or a bad direction. But I was absolutely, as they say, gobsmacked. I mean, I, I was dead in the water. I didn't know what to do. Well, Carl Reiner saved me. I mean, he, he, editors do not want you to come home empty-handed. No way. They want, no matter what, you got to bring the goods. So um, Carl Reiner's Rat sort of lapsed into his character in the 2000 year old man and started saying, Hey, Mel, didn't you um, do the 12 chairs and, um, and didn't you take Joan of Arc? And he started creating this three way interview. And Brooks would re respond to his old buddy, um, but not to me. Um, it kind of reminded me of the time when I interviewed Aung San Suu Kyi for the New York Times, uh, and she had been under house arrest. That is the now uh, leader of uh, uh, of Burma, uh, of Myanmar, and uh, she she had been under house arrest for many years. But there was a brief period in the '90s when she was not, and uh, I recognized that when we did the interview, she didn't respond to me at all. Uh, some, there were women of a certain age who just didn't see other women. And she was, I thought, sort of like a man's woman, as the phrase was. Uh, and I'm going to move over a little more to be on camera. I get notes to, ah, oh, Shri, hello, good morning. Uh, I, I, anyway, am I more centered or less? Yes, no? Um, um, we, uh, I, I can't hear you, whatever it is. Uh, so I was saying you might want to move the screen over just a little bit. How, if you can, if the I, I don't laptop, want to you can move the laptop at all. It's not a laptop. It's it's a desktop, and I can't move it. And I yeah, don't. If the, if, the, if the screen can move a little bit, great. Otherwise, don't worry. You're, you're doing great. Thank you. you. Know, I can do people some watching all over it. the world. Yeah. Sorry, people all over the world. I'm uncensored. But I'll, I'll do the best I can. Let me finish the story. Uh, so um, she just, you know, I traveled like thousands of miles. I had gotten one of these rare, difficult visas. A lot of what you get is a fluke. Um, and I, a member of Congress had negotiated it for me, and that's that's how it happened. Uh, it, it, it was just lucky, and I was there. Uh, and she just was ignoring me. She wasn't relating to me. Um, and I realized she, she would. I would ask her a question, and she would answer to my photographer, who was very talented, magnum photographer. But I wasn't in the room, so I began just addressing questions to my photographer, uh, and she would answer them. And then I would address another question to Steve, and then she would answer. It was like doing simultaneous interpretation, but in English. Um, so you improvise. Sometimes you need an intermediary. Whatever works. Whatever works. So, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see some of the comments that have been coming in. Danielle says, Claudia is the author of the book Interview, a compendium of interviews with persons including the Dalai Lama, Dan Rather, Tony Morrison, Benazir Bhutto. And as we said, uh, Nitin's watching from Dharamshala where the Dalai Lama lives, yeah. uh, as, where he escaped to, as you know. And I love that you met the Dalai Lama, says Anne. And so people are responding. Yeah. Uh, he said it was uh, Mark says, 
I irritated the Dalai Lama. Ooh. Ooh. I, <laughs> yes. Do you want to hear that story? Of course, please. Yeah. Well, uh, the AARP's magazine had us. Oh, it wasn't the AARP's magazine. That was later. Uh, the Times magazine had a 100th anniversary edition uh, that uh, was going to happen. Um, maybe not 100, but it was a significant anniversary. And they had asked various writers to go out and interview people about the future and what they saw was going to happen in the next 100 years. And so I went to talk to the Dalai Lama. And this he was giving a speech in Indiana. He didn't go to Dharamsala. And I asked him about his predictions for the next hundred years. And he looked at me and said, well, you know, I don't think that way. And I said, well, please try, because that's the theme. And um, he said, really, I don't think that way. So I kept on asking him questions about the next hundred years. And um, the next time I saw him, I interviewed him for the ARP's magazine. And um, I had to ask him questions about aging. And uh, he said, oh, now I remember you. You were that irritating. <laughs> so my my um, one of my claims to fame is that I irritated the Dalai Lama, which is about as bad as you can get with him because he's very charming, lovable, and happy, and sweet, uh, although very political and very determined. He's very funny. He, he, uh, He's, he's very funny. Whereas Mel Brooks can okay. be. Let's, let's take a look at this story here. I'm just gonna say hi to my camera on this side. Hi folks, thanks for joining us. Tell us where you're watching from. Please tag your friends. We want everybody in who you know to see this. Hit share, retweet, find us on LinkedIn, share the story. There's an incredible conversation. Claudia's teaching us, enlightening us, giving us so much insight into the way journalism works and also into the minds of some of the people she's interviewed, really famous, interesting people. And uh, we're just so grateful to Claudia for being here with us. Please keep hitting share and posting and uh, sharing your comments and asking your questions of Claudia Dreyfus. It's about 9.20, we'll go about 40 more minutes here, 9.20 East Coast time if you're watching live. And then at 10 o'clock, we have a wonderful medical expert who'll be here and Severinson will and Severino will be here. She is a uh, an expert on nursing and taking care of elderly folks. But I can answer your medical question. She was on my WBAI show, which takes place Saturdays noon to two. It's a call-in show, and she stayed for two hours to answer our medical questions. So please tune in for that at 10 a.m. Eastern time in about 40 minutes. So let's see what's happening in the newspaper. It says some Republicans see Trump sinking and taking the Senate with him. We want to state that her husband, Claudia's husband, mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Hacker's book is called Downfall, and it predicts that the president and the party will lose. He showed his charts. He showed his graphs. He has made the ultimate long bet by saying uh, she's holding up the book there, as you can see. Yes. Very nice production work. Uh, yes. she's, she's showing uh, that. The, this is what uh, might could happen. And Susan Collins is in trouble, as is uh, Tom, uh, Tom, Tom Tillis of North Carolina, Susan Collins of Maine. And uh, Susan Collins has an opponent named Sarah Gideon. And Sarah is the daughter of an Indian immigrant. Uh, her father is Indian, her mother is not. Or her mother is Indian and her father is not. And that's where the Gideon name comes from but just an example of what the Republicans have uh, to face this coming year. With schools closed, books come to them. The Neediest Cases Fund. Can you talk, if you're familiar with the neediest cases and how the New York Times does this kind of work, raising funds? They do this for decades, they've been doing this. Yes, for, uh, in the pre-Christmas period, they tell the stories of people who are helped by the, the 100 neediest funds and, um, and, and then they asked readers to contribute, and it, it, it's a series of worthwhile charities. But again, like, just like the, the paper has become more modern and more in tune with the time, the charities that they're giving to 
are also more in tune with the moment, uh, less religious charities and instead refugee groups, uh, uh, food banks, uh, things that are needed very much now. And um, I, I, uh, I urge you to give. Uh, years ago, my friend Marvine Howe, who was a distinguished foreign correspondent, when she came back, they would have her write the hundred neediest cases up. And she loved going to people's houses and meeting them and talking to them about their lives. And the Times is doing that very well. Also, I think fabulously with the numbers of people who, who died of COVID. And it's, it's horrible, but you see the range of, of what what is going on. And uh, even in your isolation, you can feel it. I, I've lost- Thank you, Claudia. Well, I know. Sorry, go ahead, you were saying you, you've lost? In, in, you know, I, I think of my own experience is typical. In, in my world, I've lost about five people already to the plane, this plane. And it's uh, including a close friend and her companion husband uh, who died the next day. And these are things we never expected in, in our safe American lives, safe American middle class lives. We expect it to be safe from the, from the randomness of the world, and we're not. Thank you, Claudia, and my deepest condolences to yeah. your loss. Uh, may their memories be a blessing. I, I can I can relate. We've lost at least five people whose homes we have been to in the last 20 years or who've eaten and been to our house for parties uh, in the last 20 years. And to lose them at this moment is just so, so sad. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, let's look at this section of the New York Times. They They have an ad here for the Time store. And my wife once got me this custom birthday book and it used to be $100, now it's $80, where you can get a book for Mother's Day or Father's Day or a gift. It's, uh, they, you can pick any day in the last, you know, 100 years and they, they put the name of the, of the person on the cover. And so my wife got me one for my birthday, October 28, 1970. And uh, uh, one, one one item of dispute is, do you get the book, do you get the day uh, you were born or the day after you were born? Because of course the news of that day is from the day after, but I'm sure um, most people will not, their births will not be covered on that day. So it's okay to get them the day they were born. That's the paper. Uh, look at this, Boeing ends a deal to buy jet unit for $4.2 billion. This is how things are changing so fast in so many ways. Obituaries. I've been reading about how uh, the New York Times, of course, has been doing obituaries for years, but so many obituaries are running across the country that regional newspapers are having to staff up and getting sports writers to write obits because more than 54,000 people have died in the United States. 58,000 died, soldiers and, and service men and women died in Vietnam. And now you're seeing that number happening in just two months. And that's the uh, problem. John H uh, Houghton, 88, scientist who sounded alarm on climate change, dies in 1994. He urged the world to do what we can now and not wait 20 or 10 or 20 years. And it's so sad to think that people like him were ignored in many ways by, because, or because of things like politics. And here are more obituaries running the soundtrack of New York now in Manhattan, you hear these ambulances all the time. Those We've Lost is a section here online that Neil is showing us as they're trying to look at people just beyond the numbers. And there's a nun, and there's a World War II vet, and a civic leader. Look at these ages, right? 78, 41, Fred the Godson, a New York, a New York rapper, John Houghton, there he is. Let's just see this list. Uh, Iris Love, 86, style, uh, style per, uh, Abba uh, Kayari, staff, chief of staff to Nigeria's president. So you get a sense of this, uh, how, how sad this is. Uh, speaking of sports, as we did earlier, this is the sports section is now, the Sunday sports section, which has always had so many stories, is now online. I mean, now inside the paper, I'm sorry. Uh, the draft filled a void, but what happens next? Thanks to a signature shot, Duncan can bank on the hall. And this is about Tim Duncan going 
to the uh, uh, Hall of Fame. And uh, here's Tom Brady and this video of this, uh, these friends playing uh, tennis or at least doing some rallying across rooftops in Italy, I thought was just amazing and will be one of the memories that I carry with me of, of this uh, entire crisis. Uh, let's, let's take a look at that at-home section, which, uh, as you heard, uh, this is now a new section that will help you work and have fun and know what to read and even five weeknight dinners that you can cook. Because I will tell you that my wife is standing here near me. Uh, she's not camera ready, but she says uh, she's been saying how much harder everybody's working on her team, her friends, herself. I see it every day. There's no downtime. There's no time for lunch. There's no because the meetings just keep piling up. The one Zoom call, one WebEx call after another. Shop better when almost everything you buy has to be delivered. Thinking about what you purchase and from whom matters. Excellent piece. My former student, Shira Ovide, uh, wrote this. Uh, Shira, well done. Uh, here is Catherine Newman. Sink a battleship by the railroads via Zoom and how you can play battleship, Pictionary, Monopoly, etc. Read these new books. So they're giving you things to do, making it through math and so many interesting things. Uh, the email that I got about this was written by uh, Sam Sifton, who you know helped uh, reinvent the cooking uh, portion of the times. And here is why not get into yoga. So 10 easy poses that you can do, including downward facing dog, of course. And with that, I'm going to bring in our downward facing dog right here, who's licking a peanut butter jar, uh, an old and empty peanut butter jar. That's Tara. She's wearing a, what in India is called a banyan or in America called a vest and has a terrible name, the wife beater. And uh, the reason she's wearing that is when we go out, we're trying to minimize contact with other dogs, other people. So just so that the virus doesn't land on her fur, uh, as you may have seen uh, this week, story of two cats who did get the virus. And uh, so our uh, own vet told us, send out an email saying, do not uh, take your, let your dog off leash. Do not let it meet other dogs. Tragic for dogs to deal with this. Our own dog used to go for three to four walks a day, now does just two. So she's doing her part when she do, does her part. And so an hour of screens, you can forget it. Letting the three-year-old watch Frozen to at 8 a.m. is not the end of the world. Uh, let Think about the three C's, child content and context. I love that, the best lap desks, some ideas on that. Uh, this is my lap, this is my desk that I use for standing. As you know, standing is the new sitting. And uh, so the more you can stand, the better. So this is something called the stand stand that I use. And five dishes to cook this week in the New York Times, including curry chicken breasts with chickpeas and spinach, potatoes, salmon, tomato, chickpeas. Again, lots of vegetarian options. Try this natural deodorant and watch these, the BBC on the tube. Get your medicine cabinet ready. This is a keeper, as they say, folks, and how to give yourself a buzz cut uh, Sanam Yar's story on that and uh, fascinating. Uh, it was the first time I'm seeing this sponsored by Yardbird. Finally, affordable outdoor furniture, free, fast, contactless delivery. I love it. So uh, please check out the at home section and then we will say a whimsical goodbye to the travel section or a wistful, wrong word, wrong English word there. I meant to say uh, uh, wistful and I use the word whimsical. Uh, the travel section. First, let me ask Claudia, what do you think of the home section as you saw it through my lens? I, I, and I, any I'm going to read it the minute we get offline. But can I relate to one of the stories you mentioned about Republicans being scared uh, of, of losing the Senate? I have to tell you again about my hubby's book. Uh, when he first started working on it uh, two years ago, really after the 2018 election, he said to me, uh, I think I, I think that Democrat, any Democratic candidate can win in, 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 two twen uh, in 2020. And I think the Dems have a 50-50 chance of taking the Senate. And I said, you know, from here, I'll make a partisan statement from, from your mouth to God's ears. Uh, but uh, his, 
he said, no, I, I'm looking at the numbers. He's a political scientist by profession. Um, and he, uh, he doesn't look at polls. He doesn't look at focus groups. He doesn't do futurist punditry. He looked at numbers. He says, I look at what people do and what, not what they say. And when he analyzed voting patterns, this is what he saw, well ahead of anybody else. Uh, he exactly predicted what, uh, what is in that story in the news section today. And people rather thought he was a bit off the wall with, with these predictions. He's kind of unafraid of, of doing uh, contrarian things. So he, he, he went for it. And the book just was published this week. And now there it is on, on the front page of the paper, a similar assessment to what we were predicting two years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I'm just going to turn the camera around here so we can. So forgive me for being tacky and promoting my husband's book. Um, but these days, uh, one, of the, one of the truths about book publishing at this moment is that all the regular forms of getting your story out there are not present. It, on Monday, he was to have had a fantastic launch party that his friends, Dan and Joanna Rose, were going to give him at, um, at the Century Club. At the Century said, yeah. well, that's not going to happen. But when you consider all that people are losing these days, it's a lot more than book tours. So uh, we're very grateful in any case. Uh, but it's hard to have a book come out at this moment. We understand that uh, one of the things that my team has been doing is virtual book launches for authors. Ah as we, uh, instead of having a party on the Upper West Side, as one of my friends did, we said to them that you can uh, have a party for the entire planet watching. And this is what we did with Marco Greenberg. And he had six, uh, sorry, four of his uh, subjects of his book come on and we had just a good time. And there was a, a chance for us to do a virtual toast to Marco. And his book is called primitivebook.com. You can check it out, Primitive is the name of the book. And how tapping the primal drive that powers uh, how to tap the primal drive that powers the world's most successful people. So an example of the kinds of things we've been doing, Claudia, including a Holocaust memorial to our program that we did for our friend Ann Kirshner. Uh, we are working with a university to do this, uh, kind of uh, take their all their conferences and make them online. We're working with Hong Kong University to host conversations. So anybody who's watching who's got something that they're thinking of canceling or postponing, talk to us. And we'll help you. We'll help you think through the process. Uh, we're, we don't want to sell you that. We want to help you be better and stronger at what you're doing. Here is the letters to Salah, a Holocaust commemoration. But this is work that uh, Neil and my team and I are doing. And we want to work with people around the world. Uh, and we got to do celebrate the 456th birthday of William Shakespeare. And we did an event with 12 of the biggest organizations in Stratford, including the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust as well as uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company and the mayor of Stratford. And we had them all on a show and celebrating the, the uh, birthday parade had been canceled for the first time in, a, in 200 years. And we brought it back, but online. And my team were very proud that we did this. It took us 70 hours from idea to execution. So anybody who wants a party, who wants uh, help with anything they're doing, contact us. We even have someone who's specializing in making online bar mitzvahs work better. Anybody can do anything online. We can help it be better and a better experience. So let's move on and let's talk about, uh, we have so much more of the paper to go and so much more of Claudia's life to talk about and work. Uh, and Laura says, this is not tacky. Why shouldn't you promote it? Uh, the, the, thank you, Laura. Laura is a great former guest on the show and a great supporter. We should promote people want to read good books, why not read Downfall, The Demise of a President and His Party by Andrew Hacker, who is also known as the person who lives in that apartment and sometimes uh, also gets to read the New York Times when uh, Claudia never. is not reading it. He never forgets to read the New York Times. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, let's move on. I'm going to 
I'll flip the camera here. That so this is a mistake that I made. I uh, Neil gave me the chance to flip the camera when the overlay card came on, but I was too busy talking to Claudia to to do that. So I'm going to flip the camera now, and we have James Ferrari. Is that Jamie Ferrari? Higher. Is he the higher ed consultant that I once interviewed? Uh, he will tell us uh, if he is. And here's the travel section of the New York Times. We're just going to flip through this. We will not see the travel section of the Times for a while. One of our favorite sections, most popular. We interviewed the former editor of the travel section, Monica Drake, three times on this show. And then we went to the home of Amy Vershup, the current editor. And the work of the travel section will continue, but the travel desk, but it will not be its own section for a while. And this is Sarah Khan uh, talking about an old city, a new, this is Hyderabad in India. And I'm just so sad about losing the opportunity to travel. I'm blessed that for my work, I got to travel two years ago. I traveled 275,000 miles. The carbon footprint wasn't good, but getting to see my family in India four times, my parents, my brother in, uh, in Dubai, I saw him twice this year already. I'm very blessed but now very, very sad to be so far away. Trouble in paradise as boaters seek refuge. The U.S. Virgin Islands provides a haven during the pandemic, but presidents fear, uh, residents fear the cost. One more section, special section, uh, just new, still lives, visual diaries from 15 photographers give a glimpse of life in a time of isolation. We're just going to quickly look at these pictures as Neil and his team will share the link if there is one. Because one of the things that Tom Jolly told us is that they're trying to get as many special things done in print, compilations, features, curated content, so that people would have a reason to buy the print paper. And the New York Times has also given away free access to all Corona crisis coverage of uh, in the paper, so people can see that. Beautiful photos, very, very sad photos of isolation. And then the kids section of the New York Times, we read that. That means it's been a month, Neil, since we had the kids, uh, because we had two young men join us, young boys, uh, 13 and a 15 year old who joined us and read uh, the New York Times with us. They were awesome. And uh, so here you have the New York Times, you are not alone and trying to help the kids, teach the kids, have fun with the kids. And this is Amber Williams, who is the editor. Uh, and this is a uh, an offshoot of the New York Times Magazine. Soap is awesome. Why is it spreading so quickly? Why six feet specific distance? Will there be a cure? These are questions not just kids are asking, but everyone is asking. And here's my friend Apurva Mandavili's breakthrough in the New York Times, her first piece in the New York Times. She has joined them, and I'm so glad she's doing yeah, that. So brilliant. She's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, Apurva is terrific. And I wanted to just say that last night on my show, my daily program that I have, we interviewed uh, three doctors, uh, all with immigrant backgrounds. Uh, nothing that Tom, uh, that uh, Donald Trump would hurt, hate more than having three women, three women of color, three women with immigrant backgrounds, telling him that he is wrong. Do not drink bleach, and then you know we might as well say, do not stick your hand in the lawnmower, do not put your head in the oven. All of these things that people uh, should know, but sometimes they do. Uh, mac and cheese heaven. Masks on, how kids are helping during the pandemic. Waving is boring. And uh, so uh, instead of just boring, you know, instead of just waving, you can try these other ways. And this is the New York Times for kids. This is a print only section. And even one of the ads has a beautiful uh, puzzle that people can use. This is one and only Ivan and the one and only Bob. One of my stories that uh, one of the segments we did in our uh, in our daily program this last week was four awesome children's book authors. And we laughed and laughed and laughed and they shared their story. These are rock stars in the world of children's lit. You can find all of it if you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Srinet, my YouTube channel, will really help you track all my stories, all the stuff we're doing, the, the read-along, uh, the daily shows, uh, as well as the big specials that we were doing. Uh, I wanted, before we go into the Times Magazine, I wanted to ask Claudia about her Civil War, so, uh, Civil War, Civil Rights Museum story. Yes, so please tell us about that. 
Yeah. No, I'm not old enough to have uh, been in the Civil War. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have uh, part of my history was with that when I was a teenager uh, and a freshman at NYU. One of the things I did weekends is not tell my parents, but go on freedom rides. I, I, I wouldn't dare to tell them they would have not committed it. Uh, but I would say I was sleeping over at my girlfriend Carol's house and then uh, buses would leave NYU and uh, come in front of the Loeb Student Center and we'd go to Maryland and integrate restaurants along Route 40. Uh, this was in my freshman year and I'm proud to say that I, I actually changed the policy of one drugstore in Westminster, Maryland that hadn't served integrated groups before, but did after our visit. Um, so that was sort of the beginning of my involvement in the civil rights movement. I, I am the child of refugees too, um, refugees from Nazi Germany. And I, I grew up in a world that was half European and half American not really certain of my identity in that way. And it was through the civil rights movement that I really confirmed my sense of being an American in, in this country and not in a world that didn't exist anymore, which was my parents and grandparents. Uh, and figuring that out because here was a movement where people were being braver than anything one could imagine. And for what? To make America be consistent with what it, what its stated beliefs were. And it was the most wonderful way to invent my own adulthood, which I had to do. And uh, it never left me. It's the most formative experience of my life. If I get all my work done while in sequestered, I'm gonna start a memoir that will begin with those freedom rides uh, and the people I met there uh, changed my life because they taught me that no matter what your your situation is you could make your life your own and and uh, and make your society your own but recently I, I had the opportunity to possibly take German citizenship and at the end I, I couldn't do it because those moments of being an American um, in the truest way were, were the deepest part of me. And I just could not uh, accept that other, that background part. But it, as my Aunt Higgins used to say, it's always good to have a lot of passports, but she wasn't certain I should have that one. Thank anyway, you, thank you. I'm being thank a little grim, I joke in. Thank you for sharing that story. And I just want to show you the connection to this model on the Albright interview in the Times Magazine. I'm the testimony to, I'm testimony to the fact that it makes a difference where the United States is and it's being a leader in the world matters. And we saw what happens when the government ignored the pleas of, uh, Ger uh, of German Jewish folks about what was happening uh, mm -hmm. in the early days of World War II. And uh, they ignored that and so many people perished. They, of course, and the Americans did get into the war and did help liberate those concentration camps, but it was not taken seriously. Isolationism is not what we should be looking at, and that's unfortunately uh, where we are. Uh, let's that's read the poll. It's a very good interview. That The guy they have now at, at the Sunday Magazine really does his homework, and that's key to doing a good interview that you, you really have to prepare much more strongly than you would if you're just observing something. You have to prepare almost like a, a lawyer doing a cross-examination. Um, uh, I, to I totally agree, and that's, that's really no, important. Uh, here's a poem in the New York Times Magazine. For those of you watching, we do this every week. We read this cold with no prep on purpose, and so we'll get everything from the pronunciation of the, uh, of the poet to the rhyme and the meter are all wrong. So this is not the way Claudia would do prepare for something. This is the way we do this. The Morning yeah. News by Alberto Rios. Seasons will not be still, filled with the migrations of birds. 
making their black script on the open sky those hasty notes of centuries old goodbye. The clouds in the heavens make a memo book, a diary of it all, if only for a day. The birds write much, but then rewrite all the time, news continuous, these small pencil tips in flight. They are not alone in the day's story. Jets, too, make their writing on the blue paper. Jets and at night satellites and space stations, like it or not, we're all subscribers to the world's newspaper. Written big in the frame of the window in front of us, today we wave to neighborhood riders on horses. We hear the woodpecker at work on the chimney. There is news everywhere. All the small courage so that we might turn the page. Wow. 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 Beautiful. Beautiful. May I, may I also point you, to you to something that I found absolutely brilliant in the paper? In the metro section, uh, there is essentially what is an interview with uh, a triage nurse. Uh, and it's the whole page of her own voice of what a day is like. Um, they don't run it as an interview with a Q&A back and forth. When you read it, you can see that it's a series of interviews. And it has, aside from being fantastically moving and insightful, it has all these elements that a good interview would have, which is that there's a progression, there's a story, her voice tells the story. Uh, I'm going to actually put it on my required reading list for my students. I, I'm teaching a summer course this summer. And I want them to see that as an example of great interviewing. I mean, I, I learned a lot about what her life and what her day was like in her own voice. Whoever did that did it very, very well. It's Alexis, it's a, a, a Alex Strauss who did this and David Marchese, or uh, who does, who does, I don't know the pronunciation, who does the uh, Sunday New York Times Magazine uh, interviews now. Uh, how do I deal with a friend who thinks COVID-19 is a hoax? This is one of the ethicist questions that you all can take a look at uh, online. Studies show, what does it mean for science and, the pu and public health that scientific journals are now publishing coronavirus research at warp speed? What a great question. And there's a New York Times wine club now, right? The Times is diversifying so many interesting ways. Common birds. Uh, bird watching is not always exhilarating. In fact, it can be largely mundane. How to talk to yourself. That's interesting. Patricia <laughs> asks, do you write both objectively and subjectively or only like to stick with the facts? Well, it, it depends. I think one does different things in different places. If you're doing a news story, you write objectively. And if you're doing a personal essay, you write subjectively. The, the piece you were showing about civil rights museums in the South that I did uh, in... Uh, the special museum section of the New York Times a few weeks ago. Um, that is a combination, actually, because the intro includes my subjective experience in uh, the civil rights movement. But the piece is about this uh, collection of very interesting magazine, I'm sorry, very interesting museums throughout the South. And these are only four, there are many. Uh, that I visited. And one of the things I noticed while I was there was that there were lots of veterans of the civil rights movement who would go there in the same way that, let's say, veterans of D-Day go to Omaha Beach, that they were taking their kids there. And, um, and they were uh, looking at commemorations of their own history. Um, and I found that very moving. So it was a mixture. It was that stuff, but it was also objectively telling you what is there and what is interesting. But it's also my own perceptions that were, were, were covered by um, in the story. And sometimes you can do a blend. But when I'm doing a news story, I want to sound authoritative. I don't want to sound like I'm laying my own trip on the readers because the readers have a right not to trust that if you do. And I, I often don't find uh, a lot of personal reporting. I don't want to see it in a news story, but then on the other hand, sometimes it's relevant. So, you know, each piece is a handmade piece of art or artisanship. And, it, you know, just like when a potter throws a pot, each piece is different. Well, that's true too of journalism. Yeah, I, I hear you. And by the way, when you mentioned the nurse, 
and that story, we have uh, a wonderful registered nurse and an expert on various aspects of life care, aging life especially, and and is going to be with us in a few minutes. She's already backstage and listening intently. I also want to tell you that uh, Peter Greenberg is watching, and Peter says, enjoying my conversation with Claudia Dreyfus, I uh, heard her mention a wonderful editor, Barry Golson, and I couldn't agree more. He was my editor as well when I did a number of Playboy interviews. If she happens to know where Barry might be now, I'd love to reach out and reconnect after all these years. He had much influence in my career, as I suppose he had with her, with hers. And and Peter Greenberg is a great uh, uh, user, uh, great writer and journalist, uh, the CBS travel editor, wonderful man, and uh, lives in L.A. and watching. So it's very early for you, Peter, but thank you. Claudia, do you... Uh, Barry uh, Golson? He recently sent me an article he wrote from a place in Florida. Uh, and so if Peter uh, PMs me on Facebook, I'll, I'll send him what I know. I haven't been in touch with him in many years. But, uh, I, I'm getting hungry looking at this. When yes. you desperately need a break from beans, car crab on toast is the answer. And now a look at Afghanistan's next war. And Neil will tell us if we have time to look at the video on this or just a glimpse of the behind the cover feature. And maybe we'll show that if we have time. Otherwise, we'll just, people can find that. We can put the link to it. It's one of the wonderful things that the Times does. It tells you how they make these covers in the magazine. They do a really good job. Uh, folks, I hope you'll tag your friends. We have a few minutes left here with Claudia Dreyfus of the New York Times. Uh, uh, she's been a writer for many, many years there. And uh, we are, I guess, going to the behind the cover uh, story. And so we're going to not play the whole thing, but uh, maybe we'll pick it up uh, in the middle because we don't want to give up the full two minutes. So uh, Neil's going to have the volume turned down and pick it up uh, sort of part way, and then we'll turn the volume up. Okay, here we go. The first was an image of a young woman in a hospital who'd been diagnosed with COVID-19. While that image was emotional and very moving, it spoke to one person's experience. But this story about the outbreak in Afghanistan really revolves around the border crossing. On the day that this image was shot, over 10,000 people streamed across the border from Iran to Afghanistan. It's really jarring at this moment in time to see a crowd of people, many of whom are not wearing masks. I feel like it speaks to the danger that exists there. Part of the mood that Mujib's story captures is this sense of uncertainty and fear as people try to figure out what is happening. Yeah. Last month, the U.S. State Department announced that it would cut $1 billion in aid because of political infighting within the government. I think it's important that we as an American magazine try to bring our readers' attention to the current vulnerabilities in Afghanistan, which are largely a product of the American invasion and the decades of war that followed. The challenges that everybody in Afghanistan faces right now, there are just so many. And then to on top of that add the destructive power of a pandemic, it's just kind of unimaginable. Well, and there you go. You see that there and here that's the cover. And I love how they tell that story and uh, what they do. The kitchen is closed, forced to shutter my 20 year old restaurant. I've been revisiting my original dreams for what it could be and wondering if there will still be a place in it in the city. That's her home. Just so sad. Uh, sh work shoes that employees wore during their shifts left behind at Prune's abrupt closure. The restaurant was called Prune. I've not had a chance to read this yet. And then look at this design flip, How to Stop the Next Pandemic by Jennifer Kahan. Uh, just great to see inventive design, all kinds of things on here. Just really beautifully, beautifully done. Peggy says, Claudia, I'm from Montgomery and attended the opening of the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. So interesting and vital, your early involvement in the civil rights movement. Thank you, Claudia. And thank you for sharing your uh, thoughts. Do you think you'll be able to teach in a classroom in the fall? Asked Anne. Anne. Anne used to be uh, an, an administrator in one of the departments I teach in at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. She's a poet now. Um, in any case, I, I don't know. I I um, I am teaching in the summer via Zoom, and that's exciting. I I'm so surprised. I mean, the school of uh, professional studies where I also teach. Uh, was really geared up and ready for this crisis and had people there. And we moved very quickly. And it was just amazing. Um, and 
I at first was resistant, but I took all the courses and I'm my students are pleased with what happened. I always felt very committed. They should not feel cheated. And I worked very hard uh, to to give them the rest of the semester, but they did have a half a semester of bonding and learning about each other. And that's really important. So in the fall, I don't know what's gonna happen. I'll tell you one thing. I'm very worried about the summer. I'm worried about going outdoors. I think it's all real premature. Everything I've read about the Spanish flu was that it came back the next year even stronger than it did in the first year. Uh, it did subside for a while and then it came back in a much stronger form. Uh, and I don't think we're doing any of the right things to prevent the fall from being deadly. And, and uh, I, I'm not sure I want to go outdoors then. I, I will accept whatever happens in terms of my teaching assignments because I'm committed to Thank that. You. Thank you. On our doctor show last night that you can find on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Srinet, two of the doctors disagreed on where we could go. One said the beaches on the East Coast will be open. The others predicted they will not be open. I and I worry that if they're open, closing them will be very hard. Doing all of this a second time will be much more difficult. This is about this is a story about the first fatal coronavirus outbreak in a federal prison and what happened with the folks uh, there. So you can see that. Are you a puzzle person, by the way? No, but my husband is, and he's, he's a demon. He can even do the Friday and Saturday ones, sometimes in record time. I mean, I, I hear it's he's like a serious champion. I and look, I, I don't know what this is, but we've got these the turns like this. I've never seen that before but maybe it's a common feature. Uh, I know so little about crosswords because I'm typically not good at them. So um, I had a friend who was once a crossword puzzle. I've had multiple friends who've, who've been uh, crossword puzzle clues and uh, it's, they say it's a, a, a highlight for them. Uh, how about this? The Sunday Review is going with, this is the lead story. This isn't, uh, the nude selfie is now high art. It isn't about foreplay, it's about resilience. I had guests on Friday's show talking about uh, love and relationships and dating during COVID-19. And two, uh, the two guests were the relationships columnist of the New York Times, my former student, Elizabeth Bernstein, and Justin Garcia, the executive director of the Kinsey Institute. Yes, the Kinsey Institute. So again, you can find that very easily in my YouTube channel, Srinet, and just see the entire archives. And a very important story here. Who has, corona, who has enough cash to get through the coronavirus crisis? Uh, this is a piece by my friend Alyssa Court and Yarna Serkez. Uh, Ms. Court is the executive director of the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, which I work with. And Ms. Serkez is a graphics editor for Opinion. As you know, Claudia, one of the sad things is that 40% of Americans didn't have $500 to take a cross-country emergency plane trip. That was before the crisis, before 20 million unemployed, before 20 percent unemployment. I just worry how we come back from this. And yes, we shouldn't have a the economy needs to be back. It needs to succeed. But where do we go from here? It is so scary to think about. Yes, indeed. I, I, you know, one of the things the crisis is showing us, sadly, is the weaknesses in our society and how we have been getting by sort of on hope and a prayer and on credit. Um, and now it's in this enormous crisis, maybe the biggest in our lifetimes, certainly the biggest in mine. Um, it's all kind of coming home to roost and it's very sad for the people who are this vulnerable. Uh, when I go downstairs and, and see the many homeless that are outside of my apartment building, I, I give money, but I also I give packets of handy wipes because they have no way to watch. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing more homeless on our block when we go out, for yeah. sure. Uh, look, the Nobel laureate, um, Orhan Pamuk's piece here, Diane Spelker's piece. Um, uh, Gene Sperling, former National Economic Advisor to Presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, is uh, writing 
High Rise Anxiety by Chris Ware. I love his graphic uh, work in the Times. And then Coronavirus and the Price of Trump's Delusions. A Cult of Personality is No Match for a Pandemic. And Nick Kristoff, who's been doing such great work, You yeah. Can Change Lives in a Pandemic. And he's talking about how you can reach people, who you can give money to. Every charity needs your dollars, folks. Please reach out and check out uh, his initiative, Kristoff C. 19impactinitiative.org, Christoph, c19impactinitiative.org, and How to Save Summer 2020, an editorial in the New York Times. So as we get ready to say goodbye to Claudia here, we could go on with her for another couple of hours. I want her to just uh, give us some closing thoughts uh, about the news, about what she's thinking about, and uh, what gives her any positivity or optimism about what lies ahead for us? Okay, on optimism, I think what the times are showing us is the best and the worst of our society and of our people. Uh, at seven o'clock every evening when, when I go downstairs, I started walking my dog then, um, you see the whole city come together and applaud the people who are saving our lives, basically. And but they're also saying, I exist, I'm a member of the community, I connect to each other. Uh, and that I, I go down and I start weeping because it's so moving. Um, we're seeing that, we're seeing people being really good to each other. But I also see at the same time, I went downstairs yesterday, Saturday, and it was like a carnival. And nobody was wearing a mask, or at least my, by my account, half the people were not. Never mind talking about refugees in Afghanistan. These were very affluent New Yorkers walking around with baby carriages and or jogging or biking, and they were not wearing masks. Um, and when you said something to them, they acted like you were the man, woman, or child. So that, you know, there's, there's, there are those two things going on at the same time. And I think we're going to see that at the polls too, the, the kind of polarization between people who say, yes, we're a community, Yes, we need to share, and yes, we need to take care of each other. And the people who say, I'm an individual, I'm John Wayne, um, uh, and let's send John Wayne back to um, back to the White House. Would that we even had John Wayne, that would be helpful comparison. But um, in any case, um, I wish everyone out there safety, take care of yourself, do what you can, Try to find a way to help somebody this every day in some small way, and and it, it'll all be better. And remember that being locked down in this situation is not so bad. It's staying alive. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Thank you, Claudia Dreyfus. What a wonderful morning we've had with you. You can find her on Facebook. She also has ClaudiaDreyfus.com, and she's on Twitter, Claudia Dreyfus. Please connect with her. Please check out her work. Read her archives. Go in there. Uh, she and Andrew Hacker did a fantastic job. Three weeks, uh, we had uh, both of them come in in two separate shows. And I can tell you that we needed an epic guest in between to match the two of them. And we had Judge Rosemary Aquilina, the judge who put away Larry Nasser in the USA gymnastics sex abuse scandal. That's how we... Uh, said, okay, that's the, that, that three shows in a row are all of very, very high quality. So thank you very much, Claudia. We wish you the very best. And please keep in touch. And uh, you help produce this show and these, three sh these two of these shows. So if you have ideas, you have friends uh, from the New York Times and elsewhere who'd like to join us, we do this every Sunday. We've been doing it for five years. We'll continue to do it. My email is three at three.net, S-R-E-E -E at S-R-E-E dot -E net. I'm on Twitter at three. I'm on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. Please find me. Please connect. Uh, and we are now going to move on to our medical uh, segment of the show. But thank you very much, Claudia. Good night. Good morning. It is good night for many of our viewers. It's, you lose your sense of time this way. I mean, it's Sunday, yes. Uh, I just want you to hear this, that Nicole wrote to me, watching from Trinidad, the New York Times read-along is my new happy place. So look what you did for somebody elsewhere in the world. And Laura says, wonderful, can't wait to check out her book, Interview. So that's great. Therese says, thank you so much, Claudia Dreyfus, buying your book, Interview. And Dr. Atagan, oh my God, uh, speaking of good night, 
Bernadette Aptagang is a doctor uh, scientist in uh, Heidelberg, and she joined my show at 9 p.m. at night, 7 p.m. at night. We got off the air at 2 a.m. her time, and she stayed and had better lighting and better uh, room set up than any, <laughs> any of our guests, though Claudia's lighting is pretty darn good here. And Stefan says, Claudia, wonderful hour. Thank you for sharing so many great stories. He was at the New York Times when you were there. Mark says, looking forward to reading the book. Mark's a great podcaster. Rose says, trying to find a way to help somebody. Try to find a way to help somebody in some small way every day. That's a beautiful line, Claudia. I know you did it off the cuff and look, people are already writing about it, reporting on it. And Rose is one of our producers of our daily program. So thank you so much, Claudia. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. All right, folks. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We're about to bring on our medical segment. We added this. We should normally go to 10 a.m. Eastern, but we are going longer. by About Bye. half an hour with our next great guest who's going to be here. Uh, and before we do that, we're going to have Neil tell us once again, reset the show and also tell us about our sponsors. And one of them has a great a uh, uh, mug that I have, Muckrack, I work with them. Uh, he's going to tell us about Muckrack in a minute. And uh, so I need all my sponsors to send me swag so that I can hold that up during the show. But thank you so much, Neil. What a great uh, guest. And one of the things that she taught us, the importance of prepping with the guests and having all that great material in advance. Neil, you've dedicated and donate your time to do that. And it makes the so show so much richer and better because you do that. You write a briefing document. It's amazing. My show that I do solo is exactly the opposite of all of those things. <laughs> well, thank you, Sri. I appreciate it. There are two uh, quick housekeeping items we should take care of before we bring in uh, our our next guest, uh, Anne, uh, who is a nurse, registered nurse, to uh, uh, talk to us about COVID-19. Uh, so the first thing that I'd like to do is, again, thank our sponsors. Um, we really appreciate all the support that we've gotten from Strategy Focus Group, um, uh, Muckrack, and Tweeps Map, uh, and I'm going to share the links for them uh, as well at the bottom of the screen. Please visit uh, their pages and um, please uh, check out the great work they're doing. Um, for uh, Strategy Focus Group, um, uh, is a, a global team of human capital strategists committed to helping organizations solve people issues within your organization. They do that by working alongside you to solve your toughest problems and helping you capture your greatest opportunities. Muckrack helps you discover news as it breaks, easily generate reports and explore the work of journalists, podcasters, bloggers, and more. Muckrack software helps PR teams build stronger relationships with the media. And if you're a journalist, you might also be eligible for their free tools to identify trends and showcase your work. Tweeps Map helps you build personalized relationships with your audience with focused, straightforward, actionable analytics and an all-in-one intelligent publishing platform. Thank you again to Ron Thomas of Strategy Focus Group, Greg Gallant and Mike Schneider from Muckrack and Samir Albatron from Tweeps Map for your support of the New York Times Read Along. And their links again are on the bottom of the screen. We certainly encourage you to uh, uh, visit their, their pages and learn more about the work that they do. What I'd also like to do is to take a moment and uh, talk about next week's guest, because again, one great guest after another. Uh, and I uh, really want to thank uh, Carla Baranakis, a great friend of the show, for introducing us to uh, Micheline Maynard. Um, Micheline is a uh, uh, experienced journalist, author, broadcaster, and educator. And she's a regular contributor to Forbes, runs a crowdfunded journalism project called Curbing Cars, and was the award-winning Detroit bureau chief and senior business correspondent for the New York Times. Uh, please follow her on Twitter at Mickey Maynard. Uh, and if you get a chance, tell her uh, uh, tell her hello from uh, the New York Times Read Along and thank her for joining our show next week. We're looking forward to, to the conversation with her. Again, 8.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and with that, Shri, uh, I think that we can uh, uh, introduce our next guest, the next segment of our program, Anne uh, Sansvero, um, Sansvero, uh, a registered nurse, is going to join us to talk about uh, COVID-19 and answer questions. Um, I believe you you had her on a show uh, earlier, Shri? Yeah, she um, was on my WBAI show, and uh, 
I was going to tell the story later, but I'll tell it now. So one of the things we did was we had her and a doctor from Colorado on the show with us. And we were talking about uh, how to be the, my show on WBAI Saturdays, noon to two is called uh, Coping with COVID-19, a helpful, hopeful call in show. And you can imagine all kinds of people call in and she was great as she answered all those questions. And one of the things the doctor had just said was stay out of the hospital unless you have COVID-19, meaning we don't want to see broken bones. We don't want to see like, you know, accidents. Just stay home. That's the healthiest thing you can do for the world is not go to a hospital. And then suddenly he gets paged that there's been some kind of accident uh, and he has to go into the uh, sur- he has to go do surgery at the moment for a non-COVID story. It happens all in real time. And Anne is supposed to leave my show and uh, carry on with her Saturday. And uh, on the fly, she agreed to stay for two full hours on a Saturday, sacrificing her time and uh, just her downtime and uh, join me. And she was terrific. And people loved hearing her and meeting her on the show on WBAI-FM here in New York, 99.5. FM. Uh, so thank you so much, Anne. And thank you, Neil. And let's meet Anne. Let's bring Anne on. Absolutely. Hi, Sri. How are you? Thank you Hi. for having me back again. I, I'm i having trouble hearing, but uh, maybe others it's working. I, I uh, let's hear see. Anne. Uh, Sri, did you have trouble hearing Anne? Maybe if you logged yeah. off. Shri, maybe yeah, log I'll off. Log off. So, and why, why, Neil, why don't you get started and I'll come back. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Shri. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us today. Really uh, appreciate it. Um, just to, to level set for folks, tell us a little bit about the work that you do um, in, in general. What, how, how is, how is uh, COVID-19 affecting your day-to-day right now? So Sri, I'm a nurse practitioner and I have a private practice called HealthSense. And HealthSense is an aging life care consulting company. And what we do is we help families and and, uh, their older uh, members navigate through different health challenges, um, whether it's transitions in care or maybe there's a family member that has dementia and is not doing well in their home and they need... um, guidance on how to manage their care better. Maybe they need to source good quality home care. Maybe they need to help have help navigating benefits. So this is the work that we do. And it generally involves, I have a team of uh, seven nurse care managers. And in normal times, we enter into the family's home, we meet with the family, we do a strategic plan of care, and then we determine uh, what they need and help them bring in those um, services. Uh, Prior to COVID, uh, we were, as I said, going in there, doing that kind of work. After COVID, we now have to go virtual, which is, you know, very difficult because, um, you know, we really, it's a very touchy-feely type of business, but we have been able to use technology to our advantage, and, and we still are able to navigate and quarterback and coordinate the services for those families. So I'm still, um, you know, helping families that are being discharged from the hospital, for example, try and find um, a good plan of care to uh, do that transition, you know, in scarier times and and to help them uh, be safe and well. And um, I'm also, you know, monitoring my ongoing clients and, you know, helping them navigate symptoms that they may have at home to try and avoid hospitalizations. Uh, again, trying to keep them safe at home. So, it's the work is still being done, but in a different way. I appreciate that. Uh, we did have a question earlier, and um, I'm scrolling up to find it. Uh, but effectively, uh, there was a question that um, uh, a friend of ours asked, Danielle uh, Flood, uh, was specifically talking about uh, for people. You know, is there an issue in terms of the virus? Um, you know. Uh, the way we we've heard a lot of conversation around where how how long it stays on surfaces, right? But what about uh, how high it reaches in the atmosphere for people who are in apartment buildings? Do they have to do they have to worry about it rising up um, in terms of if they're on the higher floors of a building? You know, I really can't speak to that. That's a very interesting question. Um, I would just uh, say that I think the most important thing in this regard is doing that social distancing and wearing a mask when you're with others. If, if we start 
you know, worrying about um, what's up in the atmosphere with us. I think, you know, there's so many things to worry about, right? And I think we have to put things in perspective about what we can control. Because if we worry about everything we can't control, we are gonna live in a world based on fear. So I think right now, let's stick to the facts of what we can control, which is we can control social distancing. We can control when we are going out to wear a mask, if we're exercising to do it in a solitary area. I know there has been some um, interesting articles written about people running beside each other or behind each other. And I definitely think that when you're, if you're running and you're running behind somebody else, you know, your risk for, for breathing their air behind you, there is definitely, you know, that risk there. In terms of the apartment high rise, I really can't speak to that. But again, I would go back to the old adage, do what you can do to, that you know about that you can control and do it well and, and um, be confident in that part. And, and just to point out to folks a correction on your website, it's health-sense.org uh, if people are interested in, in uh, learning more about your work and they can follow you on Twitter, Health Sense uh, LLC um, on Twitter at Health Sense LLC. Um, what, what is your take, um, um, what is your take on, in terms of uh, uh, reopening and we talked looked at some of the articles earlier uh some states some businesses they're starting to figure out how can they get back to business georgia has a partial reopening that they're trying to do um is it is it too early is it going to be different in different states um what's your sense of that so my sense is um we have other countries that have been ahead of us on this curve right um south korea um Italy, and I think we have to l learn from their lessons as well, but I, I really think that this has to be approached slowly, methodically, um, listening to the scientists who are saying that we need more testing. Uh, we need to see where the antibody um, uh, movement is going in terms of have we got a good antibody test? Can we determine um, you know, who's who's got some type of immunity or not? And that's not yet well known, right? And then in terms of traceability, are we willing as a society to um, have have apps on our phone that can trace our movements to detect to help us know where is safe to go and where is not to go, where what's what you know what groups may be in a hot spot or not? And so I think there are so many unknowns yet, Neil. That my um, take on this would be to go slowly, to really um, listen to the science. Um, I know there are economic hardships, and I know that there's also a political climate we're, environment, we're in as well. But I think from a health perspective, the last thing we want to do is start rushing out there too soon and then dealing with a really bad second wave. So let's take this cautiously, slowly, follow what other uh, countries are doing and doing well. And I would say New Zealand is, is a great um, example of that and the leadership in New Zealand. Um, has shown, you know, that they're very meticulous and methodical. Let's learn from them and let's also give our scientists time to flush out the antibody testing and get our, our own testing environment up and running. Because even though we're being told it's up and running, it isn't up and running yet. Uh, it's Yes, we're getting more tests, but it's still quite hard for you to get a test. Um, and especially getting those uh, tests where you don't have symptoms. So I think we do need more time. Take it, take it slowly, cautiously. Um, I think that Carla Varnakis, uh, a friend of ours, uh, former uh, copy editor at the New York Times and a guest on the show. Uh, again, Carla, thank you for helping us uh, to uh, to facilitate next week's guest, Micheline Maynard. Uh, she's asking how important is it to wash masks? Uh, she has the impression that many people wear them day after day without washing. Uh, certainly for people, you know, there, there, there are two groups of people now, I think in, in society, um, I'll put myself in one group as a lay person. You know, we went out for the first time, or rather my wife has been going out grocery shopping. I went out for the first time. We picked up pizza from our favorite pizza place. Um, and I'll be honest with, with everyone, just because we're all talking about our experiences, except for going around walks in the neighborhood and playing basketball with my seven-year-old outside, I hadn't actually left the house. We hadn't gotten in the car and gone anywhere in about six weeks. So this was our first uh, uh, foray. I wore a mask that my mom had sent. Uh, she had a, a, a package of masks that she had had, a really simple mask, nothing, not N95 or anything, and gloves, went to pick up pizza. 
but then there are others, there are health frontline workers who are using masks and, and uh, on a day-to-day -day basis for their jobs to protect themselves, to protect their um, patients. And, and they're the ones that I'm, I'm more concerned about. How often are they reusing them? How, how often do they have to wash them or replace them? Can you speak to that uh, a little bit? So the mask uh, discussion is really interesting because as you know, you know, the gold standard for the, um, the healthcare workers, the N95 mask. And normally even in those circumstances, they're not supposed to be reused, but because it was such a shortage of PPE, uh, healthcare workers were treating them um, like gold dust and, and um, you know, storing them after they fused them in a, in a paper bag, keeping them open to air and then reusing them the next day. Um, again, it's ideal if you don't have to reuse these, but this is what they were doing. So, and I've had healthcare workers, uh, you know, that I know, certainly when they're going into the homes that have a limited amount of masks, they will have their inside mask and their outside mask. So when they have a client that's in that they're caring for in their home, they'll have worn a mask to commute to the client. And then what they'll do is once they're in the client's home, there is their clean mask that they have stored that they will wear for that client use and then put back. Um, in terms of the general public, um, you know, I'm so glad to see now that the uh, recommendation was to wear masks outdoors because of that uh, asymptomatic carrier spread. And for the general public, I would say if you're wearing masks, I think it is a good idea if, if you're using those, um, you know, uh, cotton or washable masks. There are masks out in the market now that will take a washing a n numerous amounts of times. And um, if if I'm going out in the general public and I'm wearing one of those, I would want to wash it at the end of the day or have a few of those that I could wash and circulate. I think it's just the best practice to do. It, um, it kind of teaches you that you're in your clean environment in the home, right? And then you're outside, you have to consider outside almost like the dirty environment. And then as you come in, you clean, you're into your clean environment. So you want to use whatever you had that was dirty, you want to wash or, or store and keep in an area for 48 hours or wipe it down. And that, these are the things without being, you know, overly scary about it, you do want to have a place where you want to have that. And, and you do want to know that clean versus dirty environment. We have a, an interesting uh, comment and a question from Carla Platter. I'm going to uh, put it on the screen. It's a long question, so it might actually cover some of your chin. So just watch out for that, um, mm -hmm. uh, Anne. But uh, uh, Carla is a program uh, senior recreation center um, program director, I'm assuming. They're doing wellness checks and food supply deliveries on their participants. And she worries about early stage dementia patients falling through the cracks. Many of our people in Southwest Florida have no family in the area. Um, any tips for opening communication with distant family about increasing or beginning some home care for loved ones with dementia? Uh, this is a great question from Carla. I, I myself had to um, deal with an issue with a client of mine who had early dementia and was not social distancing when he should have been in New York. And I was very concerned and um, his healthcare proxy and power of attorney lived on the West Coast, but she really got it. And, and I said, I really think we need to have a home care worker working with him, uh, even though he is physically good and cognitively, he's not understanding the social distancing and he's going in there to fairway and being real close to people. And it's not, it's not healthy or good for him. And um, they were in agreement and we were able to have him have a worker. And since then he's been doing really well, but she's right. Older people with, uh, you know, early to mid moderate dementia, you know, are at high risk here if they don't have somebody looking out for them because they're not understanding the social distancing cues. And uh, also they're not, you know, able to exhibit the judgment that, you know, you would if, if you didn't have dementia. So that's a great point. In terms of tips for families, you know, I think you have to share with them, you know, potentially having, so, you know, in terms of distance, um, distance, modalities, I would think sometimes you have these nest, you know, monitoring devices, you have reminder devices that can help with prompting seniors to maybe stay inside or, or, or that. But um, and in here in New York, you have wonderful, you know, doormen and many buildings that can, you know, alert people to seniors that are not, you know, uh, exhibiting proper social distancing or, or going out without masks to their family members. But it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. 
And uh, our friend Mark Lee is saying, you know, some some are surprised when they are encountered with people not wearing masks. Uh, a friend who sells cars is thinking about quitting because folks are coming to her without masks. And I know stores are limiting the amount of people who can come in. Um, uh, and buses are limited to 18 people. So it really is uh, you know, having that impact on society. I'm going to see if we can bring in, uh, bring Shri back into the uh, conversation. Uh, Shri, uh, let's see if we can hear. Can you hear yeah, me? It was a terrific, terrific conversation. And Anne, thank you so much for sharing all that wisdom and insights. I, I want to remind everybody that Anne is uh, one of the rare voices you've heard on the show uh, who is uh, who's a nurse by training rather than a doctor. And one of the reasons why I've had that same issue, and in fact, my plan was to bring her on to my daily program. We've had 15 doctors and no nurses. The reason is that uh, hospitals typically don't want nurses to be spokespeople for a variety of reasons, including union issues, as well as training issues. And, um, and doctors, on the other hand, also they don't want too many of them speaking, but the ones who speak often that the ones you see on my show are in private practice. So they have their own businesses, so they can do whatever they want. Nurses typically who are frontline working in the, you know, in the hospitals don't, aren't set up typically to have their own private business and they're reliant on the hospital. But as you know, Anne, uh, as everybody's getting to see how terrific she is, Anne is in the aging life business and taking care of patients, clients who are 80 to 100 plus, God bless. And as a result, her training as a nurse, but she's also a small businesswoman. We hope going to be a big businesswoman. And uh, she has been able to give us so much in insight and information. We're so grateful. Uh, we have a couple more minutes if you can stay, Anne. Uh, so let's take some more questions that are coming in, some comments. And uh, 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 just tell us about the Aging Life Care Association and what exactly it does and why it's important. After meeting you, I was telling my wife that uh, we need to sign up for some kind of, you know, how the way people can buy burial plots long in advance. Um, as Hindus, we will not be looking for a burial plot, but maybe we need to contract with Anne in advance uh, because we're not going to rely on these 17 year olds now. And of course, they'll be older then to take care of us when, when, they, when we need Anne's help. So, Sri, you mentioned the Aging Life Care Association. So that's a nonprofit organization. I'm on the board of the organization. It's a national organization, and it really um, is all about educating people in the life care business to, you know, have best practices, best ethics best ethics and so it also connects families with aging life care professionals so we're basically a group of professionals that have a holistic view of aging that help you strategize and plan and um, we do crisis management we do triage we do advocacy we um, help with health and disability issues navigating benefits um, all of that and we if you look on the aging life care association website which is aginglifecare.org if you put in your zip code around the country you'll be able to find an aging life care expert you know anywhere around where you are you'll be able to look at their qualifications their background and um again they can help you navigate issues in in the health and aging fields because it is very fragmented out there in the community for some of these families um you know as the older population are growing you know, ever older, and there's a, you've heard the term silver tsunami, um, you have the uh, aging boomers almost like sad, becoming old themselves, but um, also having responsibilities for older parents. So I, I, can't, I often see 70 year old um, uh, clients who are caring for their 100 year old parents. So we're here for them, we're here for the younger generations, and we're also here for a group called we call elder orphans, which are older people that may not have any family members themselves, but want to do and plan and make sure they age well themselves, and they want somebody as a resource for that. So those are some of the services that aging life care folks do. They generally have a nursing or social work background or gerontology background, a professional background, and uh, they also have great resource networks locally. Thank you. What uh, what a great service that your 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 colleagues offer. And can I get you to give a shout out to nursing as a profession and a career, please? Uh, 
So nursing has been a wonderful career for me, Sri. I came over here as an immigrant myself. I'm an Irish immigrant, Italian name, but my maiden name is O'Toole. And I came over in the 80s at the height of the AIDS crisis and um, got a job as a nurse here in working in the New York City hospitals and um, ended up getting advanced education uh, as a nurse practitioner, which is a nurse that you can diagnose and prescribe. You have lots of different um, specialty fields you can go into. But nurses are not just bedside nurses. They're educators. They're administrators. They're leaders. Their public health is a really strong area for nurses. So that's why I think in this particular time, it's the age and decade of the nurse because it's all about public health. It's all about education. It's all about empowering people to take responsibility to make good decisions for their own health. And this is what we all need to do now in this uh, era of this pandemic. We've all got to uh, take care of each other by doing the best health practices because we are all in the community. We're all in this together. We all need to do best practices with uh, COVID, uh, reducing COVID transmission by educating each other and by mentoring each other through this. And thank, thank you, you. And thank, thank you very much. And Sheree, I wanna get uh, back to one question that I tried raising earlier. Um, we had someone who had asked uh, about uh, the virus and whether there was a concern in terms of being at a you know, high rise, whether the virus uh, uh, rises up in the attic in the, in the uh, altitude on higher floors. So Ellen is just asking for confirmation. Uh, is living on a low floor more dangerous than a high floor? You did address it earlier, Anne, but if you could repeat your your answer, I thought that it's, uh, it was worth it. So uh, my uh, answer to that, Ellen, is I really honestly don't know the answer to that question. I do know the... Um, I do know that when you are running behind somebody who might cough, you know, or, or breathe, uh, and you're not running at a safe, safe distance from that person, the organism can, the virus can spread back. And I think that's really important, the social distancing. In terms of the height of the apartment, I really can't answer that. But I will say that, um, that my answer to that before was control the things that you can control and try not to be too fearful about the things that you can't control. So really, you know, just do your best practices with all the science that you know right now. And um, I think it's far more dangerous in my mind to be in large groups and not wearing masks for protection or not washing your hands or not social distancing. So I know that's not um, a satisfactory answer. And I hope that somebody else can weigh in and answer on that. But that's my answer, which is control things that you can control. Um, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Anne. And uh, a final I wanna question. Say, I want to say to that that uh, Anne is giving you the right information that we don't know. So many things we don't know. How science works is something new happens. And then scientists do research over many months, many years. And so questions about high rises and low rises and so one of the certain things they have studied is feet. And it turns out that in the ER, COVID-19 is showing up in the shoes of uh, doctors and nurses as they're doing their work. So these things will have to take time. And even a scientific study doesn't mean they have the entire answer or it's even accurate. As we know, tragically for, uh, for America, in the 60s, Harvard Medical School was paid uh, to uh, show that the biggest problem in America is fats and not sugars. And as a result of that, all the emphasis was on fats and ignored sugar as a problem. Uh, and those medical researchers, among the best in the world with the great university name, uh, succumbed to the temptation of greed and we ended up where we did with that. And so when America in the 60s could have said, let's go after sugar and the problem it has Instead, we went after fats, and then what happens? Everything in America is full of sugar, and we have the high rates of obesity and everything else that we have seen. And that's one of the reasons why so many problems exist today with COVID as well. So thank you, Anne, for being really clear that we don't know all the answers, and even Dr. Fauci doesn't know all the answers. It was wonderful, and we are hoping, if we have time, we'll show a quick clip uh, from Saturday Night Live where uh, the former sexiest man alive, uh, Brad Pitt played Dr. Fauci, who to many of us is the sexiest man keeping us alive right now. 
And one of the things that uh, we talked about on my doctor show last night, and Anne will agree, don't drink Lysol, don't drink disinfectants, things like that. We have some questions from my family right here. They, they're asking about Clorox wipes. We're using them so often. They're part of our daily lives now. A, if we can't find them, what to do? And B, once we find them, is there any long-term impact that you worry about, even if you don't know the research yet, about these wipes on our skin and what they're doing to our hands and things like that? So with Clorox wipes, um, I'm using them primarily to wipe down surfaces, knobs. You know, when I, if I'm going out, I'm wiping down the surfaces or I have, I'm having it, wiping it with an elevator button. For my hands, I'm using sanitizer and I'm using um, soap and water, antibacterial soap and water. So I'm primarily using the wipes on surfaces. And I think that if you use wipes on your actual own skin all the time, you're probably going to get some irritation there. In terms of um, when you can't access Clorox wipes, well, you can have um, the cloth and you can spray you can spray solution on a thin cloth and, and soak it and put it in a little plastic bag so that you have maybe a Lysol spray and you spray down, you know, a thin rag and a clean thin rag and keep that in a plastic baggie and you have, yes, it's not disposable, but it's, it's, it's there and you've got Lysol on it and it's wiping down the surface that you're doing. And again, you're washing your hands and your, your hand sanitizing as well. So there are always solutions um, to everything. And, and that's, a, that's a quickie that I've just come up with off the top of my head. I love that. And there is some formula that people can find how to make a solution for your solution and what the percentage of alcohol and all of that is. We have a question from Patricia on LinkedIn. And thank you to our great LinkedIn audience every week. We're really grateful. Patricia asks, is COVID-19 disrupting HIPAA? So first, if you can explain what HIPAA is, because our international audience may not know. And what do you think about what's happening? So that's a very interesting question. HIPAA is the um, Health Information Protection Act that uh, was passed so that um, people's healthcare information was being protected. And now we're seeing a lot more um, telehealth going on, obviously. And um, some of the HIPAA regulations are being relaxed because uh, HIPAA, while it's it's wonderful for protecting healthcare information, it can also be um, tricky to navigate uh, in, ter in terms of uh, when we're distancing and trying to people are trying to access information in parts. So the governor has relaxed some of those HIPAA regulations. I think it is a you know you have to weigh the risks and benefits of your information being released and being able to access care. So I think that's the um, that's the big um, give and take here. What what is what is going to happen with that? And I know that um, when we talk about um, open privacy issues, it's also the same issue. Um, if we want to do, for example, uh, tracing of the disease spread, right? Using apps, um, I believe Apple and Google are are coming up with these apps where we may have it on our phones and then we can be traced and determined where we are, when, where we're at in the community in terms of spread. You know, what is the balance between our privacy being traced versus the greater good of stopping the pandemic? So these are all really interesting um, things to consider that, that we'll have to, there's no right or wrong answer here. I think it's all going to be a risk benefit in terms of what we're willing to accept as a person and as a society. Thanks, thanks, Anne. And uh, we have one last question that uh, I'm going to uh, pose uh, on behalf of my mom, uh, and I'll bring Shri back in as well. Um, can you explain the difference between visiting nurse service and your organization, um, the Asian Life Care Association? Can you can you talk about the difference there? So first of all, my my actual company is called HealthSense, and that's a care management consulting company. It's a private company. So I'm the CEO and founder, and I have uh, seven nurses. I have a social worker, and I have two cognitive enrichment specialists. So that's my business, and um, I'm the owner and founder. 
Um, I'm a nurse practitioner by background, and then I do what's called aging life care. So in visiting nurse, visiting nurse is basically, you know, it's, it's a nurse from the visiting nurse organization that's, uh, that provides visiting nurse services after somebody is discharged from a hospital. It's covered by Medicare. The, the nursing visits are usually, you know, fairly short. They're, they're focused on that one area of how you're doing after your hospitalization or how are things going with your diabetes. So it's disease management focused. Um, and it's covered by Medicare and it's, it's there for a short period of time. Um, in terms of my services, ours are much more holistic in the sense that we're going in and doing a lot of uh, broader uh, planning. We have um, expertise in housing, in you know, benefit navigation, in advocacy. It's, it's a kind of a broader, more holistic approach. It is private pay, so it is not covered by Medicare. There are some long-term insurance services that cover um, the services. Uh, and then just lastly, the Aging Life Care Association, which I'm on the board of, that's a nonprofit organization that, that really is, a, is an association that does best practices or teaches best practices and mentors uh, aging life care professionals. And um, it's, a, it's a source where somebody can, um, you know, find a, a, a really well qualified aging life care professional. Um, so great question. Um, we do work many times with visiting nurse service. We work in conjunction sometimes, but we also work standalone. And uh, I'd like to uh, um, recognize Courtney Pulitzer, who was uh, able to join us uh, um, just toward the end there. But she was thanking you for some of the great information and for promoting aging life care. Uh, Shri, I know that uh, Courtney is uh, um, a, a friend of yours. Friend of a friend of 20 plus years, early tech pioneer. She was a guest on my Sunday night positivity show, which is at 9 p.m. Eastern tonight. We'll tell you about that in a second, but she was there a couple of weeks ago. Again, my archives of shows, we've done 45 shows. Today's the 45th straight day that we've done these shows. Please take a look and you can see the greatest hits of the Sunday New York Times read along as well. They're on there, so please, uh, take a look and uh, see this. These are now all on YouTube. Find my YouTube channel, YouTube slash Net, where you can find that. So we're going to let Anne go. And thank you so much. You are a hero to us for everything you're doing and working with such a difficult uh, population to navigate as both, as you said, people older and younger are trying to figure out uh, what aging life care looks like. And we're so grateful to you uh, for being here. Please check her out on Twitter. She's helped since... LLC, Health Sense LLC, and her uh, website is health-sense.org, health-sense.org, and we are very grateful to you and uh, coming on on short notice. And tell your friends, we are looking for medical professionals to be with us every week, and as long as the crisis is on. And so uh, we'd love to have more folks join us, and I'm also looking for folks for my show as well, And Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sri. Thank you for having me, Neil and Sri. Take care. Thank you, everybody. And that was Anne, who is just fantastic. Please do uh, check her uh, work out and also email us, 3 at 3.net. If you know a doctor, a physician, and hospital administrator who'd like to be on our show to talk about these issues, uh, we're doing this here at, uh, at the end of our read-along every week and also on my daily programming. Let's give a couple of alerts before we say goodbye. Tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern is my next show. Uh, please tune in. We have Sunday Night Positivity with Purna Jagannathan. She's an actress you know from Big Little Lies, The Night of Deli Belly, Better Call Saul. And she has a big new show called Never Have I Ever, and it premieres on Monday on Netflix. But you can join her tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern as we talk about positive issues. Last week, we had Tal Ben-Shahar, who uh, taught the two most popular classes in the history of Harvard University, and he did a great job with us uh, to talk about positive psychology, and it was so much fun. I learned a lot, so please check out those archives, but these positivity stories are great, and Purna is also hosting uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern a dance party, a Bollywood dance party with the great DJ Rekha at 1 p.m. Eastern on uh, Instagram, and you can find her on Instagram, and you can see the ad links right there on the screen. So follow her today at one o'clock Eastern. Do some Bollywood dancing with your family and friends, and then join us at 9 p.m. Eastern. And we have a great guest next week on the Sunday New York Times read along, don't we, Neil? We do. Uh, Micheline Maynard, 
will be joining us May 3rd, next Sunday. Uh, she is an experienced uh, journalist, author, broadcaster, and educator, and was an award-winning Detroit bureau chief for the New York Times. Again, thank you to Carla Baranakis uh, for uh, introducing us uh, to her. We're very much looking forward to that, uh, that conversation. Uh, please follow her on uh, Twitter at Mickey Maynard, uh, her Twitter, uh, that's her Twitter address, and you can let her know that uh, we said hi and that we're looking forward to her joining us on next week's uh, show. So that's that sounds awesome. I've known her for a long time from a distance and on Twitter and Facebook, but to see her on screen will be fantastic. 8.30 to 10 a.m. Eastern. We've been doing the show for five years. Neil and the production team have taken it to a whole new level. And we're so grateful. We've got lots of people who've promised to be guests in the weeks ahead, and we will uh, tell you more about them. Just subscribe to my YouTube account. It will help you keep track of all of this. And I just want to say we have an amazing lineup coming up this week on the daily program. We have poetry. It's National Poetry Month. And so there's going to be a, po a, po a great poet joining us on Monday night at 7. And then we have several other things coming up, including Thursday night. We're going to review how foreign affairs are being covered in the American press with the foreign editor, the international editor of the PBS NewsHour, Morgan Till, will be with us. Matthias will be with us, who is uh, runs Twiplomacy, which covers how foreign leaders are using Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and then on Friday, that's on by the Thursday night at 8 p.m. And Friday, I'm really excited, is the 50th day of this show. I'm sad that we've been on lockdown for 50 days, but we're going to do some epic programming. Some epic guests are going to join us. Uh, Neil, knowing how crazy I am, I might do one long show for a couple of hours, or we might do three shows, one in the morning, one in the middle of the day, and one at night. You never know what insanity and what shenanigans happen when I'm let loose with uh, a show like that, but it's yes, our 50th sir. day. Just remember, we have other plans on Friday as well, Shri, with the yes, I know. And, I know. I know. Uh, from really, Princeton University. Yeah, we're very excited about that as well. So we'll have to figure that all out. And that's part we can of, do it. of this. Yeah, we can. And a reminder to everyone watching, if you have a book launch, you have a show, that you a conference, a meeting, don't do just another boring Zoom meeting. Call us. We will help you. We did this virtual book launch for our friend Marco Greenberg with his great book, Primitive uh, which is about uh, how the primal drive that powers the world's most pub successful people. So many other things that we're doing, working with universities, working with private clients. We can help you make any event better, whether it's an event for 10 people or 10,000 or 100,000 or a million people. Contact us and we will help you. Letters to Sala, a wonderful show that Ann Kirshner put together with Jill Vexler and special guests almost 10 speakers. The National Archivist of the United States was on it. And here is the program we did from start to finish 70 hours. I do not recommend doing that. Neil had to wake up at 4.30 in the morning to go live at 6. But amazing to celebrate the 456, 456th birthday of William Shakespeare. We're the mayor of Stratford. We have the vicar of the church where Shakespeare is buried. We had the school, the headmaster of the school he went to. Uh, we had the mayor. We had the Royal Shakespeare Company, we're the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, and you can go back and look at that on our programming. So please contact me. We have a wonderful brochure that we've made uh, so that we can help you think about these issues. If you can't afford us, that's okay. We'll tell you how you can do it on your own, but it's always better when you're paying folks to do uh, ex ex excellent uh, work, which is what our team does. And Paula says, Shakespeare was worth the early wake up, and she did that sitting in Florida in Tallahassee. So let's say goodbye. Let's thank everybody. Neil will tell us if we have any other uh, outstanding work. We want to thank our, uh, our wonderful sponsors and we want you to be a sponsor. And one thing that I was going to say for a post debrief meeting with Neil, but uh, why don't we say it now here? Mother's Day is coming up. It's Mother's Day Sunday. Uh, maybe you've always wanted to sponsor, but you haven't thought of what you could do. Maybe you'd uh, we'd have a very inexpensive ad to do a greeting for mom, maybe a banner or something will make it really inexpensive and we'll gather greetings for moms around the world. Uh, Neil is wondering what the hell I'm talking about, but we'll make it happen. Neil was, is going to book a wonderful guest for that show. But uh, on the money side here, we want as many opportunities to pay professionals to do this kind of work. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for that. But we want to thank, whoops, Muckrack Strategy Focus Group, as well as Tweeps Map for all their 
wonderful work that they do to show yes. us uh, uh, support for this. And Shri, before we leave, uh, uh, Upper West Side, uh, the home of Columbia University, um, and they're doing some great work. At, uh, we should say at- um, Oh, the law school, uh, I want to tell you. Yes, thank you for looking. Look teacher, at, always a great producer. Columbia as well. Um, yeah, so I, I want to say that, uh, thank you for reminding me. Uh, yesterday on my WBAI show, which is on Saturdays, noon to 2 p.m., two hours of live call in New York. It is a circus sometimes, but a wonderful circus. Uh, I had a special guest on. Katerina Pistor is a professor who joined us, a law school professor who's already published an ebook about law in the time of COVID. So go to law.columbia.edu, law.columbia.edu, get the free book on, it covers all aspects of the law, including immigration, healthcare and the law, uh, businesses in the law, small business, big business, all of that. You go to law.columbia.edu, Katerina Pistor. It's on the front page of the law school website or just Google Columbia Law School and you will find this wonderful guide. It has only been downloaded a few couple of thousand times so far. So let's get everybody to get that no matter where you live in the world. Of course, it's about American uh, law. But a lot of the writers are international, including the professor herself, who's an immigrant from Germany. So check that out. And the travesty of what's happening with the immigration right now, President Trump has effectively banned travel. And one of my pet peeves with journalists is that we're calling it a temporary pause in immigration. How do we know that? We are only taking the president's word for this, and there is no guarantee. So be careful in the words we use in previous administrations, even in administrations that hated the press, such as Richard Nixon, there was some truth to what was being said in official pronouncements. That is no longer the case. This is not a political statement, folks. This is an observation as a journalist of 30 years that that's the circumstance we're now in in the United States. Doesn't mean we ignore the president. We means we cover it harder and stronger this administration than we ever have. The rights of the people to know is more important than ever. And we all have to step up. And here's that article and that ebook, Law in the Time of COVID-19. Everybody, please go to law.columbia.edu. It is free. It is ready. Download that. Send that to your lawyer friends. Send that to yourself. Read it. Our viewers, our listeners on WBA love this. And look at all the topics. We're just going to show you. Neil's doing a great job. Thank you, Neil. He's just going to scroll through. There's a chapter headings that we can see from healthcare to contracts. What is your contract obligations at a time of COVID-19? What does the federal government be able to do? So we can see here uh, on all of this, so much public health law, you can download right there, download the ebook, human rights and, and the law. So many great topics all in one place, public law, life and social welfare. Can the government lock you up for not wearing a mask, right? Uh, private life, uh, uh, the economy under lockdown, what is a for, you know, the, there's a phrase that they use, an act of God. Well, is this an act of God? Some legal Force scholars majeure. say this is an act of God. Sorry? Force majeure. Yeah. So is it a lock act of God or is it not? How to help small businesses survive? So many great topics. It's all free. Driver, this is a driver for contactless payments. So her colleagues around the country just got together and just wrote this really fast. She edited Katrina Pistor. She's on Twitter. Find her. This is an excellent, excellent resource. Uh, please do check it out. And she was my guest on my WBAI show. Well, Thank you. What I wanted to point out, Shri, uh, as an example of the work that we can do, it's not just about sharing a link. And it's not just about sharing, you know, here's the URL, go to uh, columbia.edu. We can actually show you a website in real time. We can actually show you video if we uh, if we need to. It makes it, it, makes it such a richer experience uh, than some of the other uh, platforms that are out there. The one thing I did want to correct you on earlier, you talked about um, the show that we do that um, we historically went from 8.30 to 10, uh, and we've extended it to 10.30 um, so that we can bring in a medical professional, often a doctor, today a nurse. Um, occasionally, we push it to 10.57 Eastern time, <laughs> um, such as today. Uh, you you are more liberal with your sense of when we end our show, Shri, which uh, I love about you. Um, but I want to thank all of our um, uh, uh, viewers for stay, staying with us. Some some people have joined late and got to watch uh, some great um, uh, content at the end. Um, we uh, Stefan is saying uh, 
Um, uh, have a great Sunday, all. Uh, Jonathan Borstein said this was a great program. I do want to point out Courtney Pulitzer, and Courtney, I will follow up with you. Mother's, Mother's Day ads are a great idea. We will follow up with the rates, and uh, we will give you a chance to uh, say thank you to your uh, moms in your in your life. Shri. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, that uh, uh, one of the things that we have to do, one of the things I've learned doing these shows every day is that we must promote the uh, sh introduce our guest again. Just mention them again because people are waking up now in California. They're tuning in. They're not sure exactly what the heck this is even because normally we're off the air by seven. Now we're you know at eight means more people waking up. So I'm going to leave it to Neil to reintroduce both our guests so that as soon as we're off the air, they can rewatch and understand the value of this show. So that's one of the things we've learned doing so many shows for so many organizations as well as my daily COVID-19 show. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and Renee is still here. Thank you, Renee Edelman, for all the great support you've given uh, the show. And our friend Chitachi is also uh, watching. It's quite worth it. Uh, so thank you for, for doing this. Uh, so uh, I will uh, remind folks, uh, so if you get a chance to come go back and watch uh, the show, um, our guest today uh, was uh, uh, Claudia Dreyfus, uh, incredible uh, writer, uh, wrote uh, the uh, longtime New York Times writer known for her interviews with scientists, policymakers, and international figures. She wrote the Conversations with Column. Um, uh, she's, she's written the Conversations with Column for uh, 20 years. Uh, great uh, profiles in Playboy magazine and Ms. Magazine. We actually didn't get a chance to, to cover this, but she wrote for Playboy and Ms. Magazine at the same time, interviewing wow. like Daniel wow. Ortega, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, Mel Brooks, uh, some of the stories. We didn't get a chance to talk about her work, uh, her uh, programs at the 92nd uh, Y, the science talk she does there. Paul Simon was a guest recently. Uh, she talked about interviewing the, the Dalai Lama and Aung San Suu Kyi. Incredible, incredible. And she's a teacher as well. She's teaching a class. She's brought in uh, the likes of Donald McNeil and Amway Orestes to, to speak to her, her students. She's teaching uh, journalism uh, to scientists so they can better convey their work. Um, I I just have to thank uh, uh, Claudia, and if you'll allow me uh, the privilege, um, you know, one of the, the things that I want to show that we didn't get to, Stephen Hawking. She did a phenomenal story, uh, interview with Stephen Hawking. Uh, Stephen, uh, Steve Taylor and, and Paula will be able to share links to that story, that interview. Uh, there's also an article about the interview in the Atlantic that that came up. So those are in the briefing document. Um, but uh, just incredible body of work she had. Uh, but my favorite, uh, this is actually from a uh, article that was written uh, about her looking back. This is Claudia Dreyfus uh, back in the 60s. Um, and uh, I did share this with her when I talked to her um, with with respect. Uh, this is an incredible picture, and uh, we loved having her on the show. Um, what an incredible career and an incredible uh, woman. What a, a great uh, in, a supporter, endorser of her husband's uh, work. Uh, the book that he wrote, um, Downfall, uh, she didn't miss an opportunity to plug her book, plug his book two weeks after uh, the show when we had him on the air. Uh, she still... Uh, promoting his book, um, so just incredible work. Next, uh, we also had um, a guest on the show. Uh, we had Anne uh, Sansevero, registered nurse, uh, talking about COVID-19 and the work that she's doing uh, with the Aging Life Care Association and her own company, Hence Health Sense. Um, so much great content, so much great work. Thank you to everyone who made this possible. Thank you to the sponsors. Thank you to our producers. Again, uh, Paula Kiger in Facebook, Steve Taylor in LinkedIn. We also had Julia Weeks uh, this week in Claudia Dreyfus's Facebook page because Claudia let us stream directly to her page. That's something else that we can do for you. If you have us produce a show, uh, we can uh, stream it to any account uh, out there uh, to get more visibility, more reach for the work. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm just going to uh, take the thank you from uh, Deborah uh, uh, Caden. Uh, I'm guessing Shri is saying hi. Um, and uh, Courtney was saying that she uh, woke up and jumped online as soon as she saw Anne on the show. 
Um, announcing the guest at the end is great. Uh, she'll definitely catch up on the beginning. So that was a good move. We'll add that to our list. Um, and uh, Deborah wanted the link to the uh, COVID-19 book again. Uh, so I will put that back on the screen. If you just go to uh, law.columbia.edu, you will find that uh, COVID-19 book. Uh, here is the ebook, Law in the Time of COVID-19. Um, so uh, uh, please do check that out. Some really great uh, content in there. Uh, and uh, Emily is ending with a great show. Thanks. Uh, I think there's no better way to end the show than that. Uh, thank you, Shri. Thank you to all of our guests. We will see you next week. Same time, same place. Bye-bye.